And we're live. Welcome to the Mission Focus series of webinars aimed at getting you from where you are just now to joining Police Scotland as a police officer. I'm Rhys Dow, I'm, the, I'm your host for one, I'm your mentor for another one, but I'm also the CEO of Mission Focused and we've got a lot to cover in this series of webinars so I don't want to waste any more, more time, so let's just get straight into it. Now the first webinar, which is this webinar, is going to be designed, it's going to be short, it's going to be quick, you'll only have to listen to this one once but it's just going to cover the basis of the information that you need to know about how to use the book, how to use the webinars, and also how to use the coaching if that's one of the packages that you've bought. Now, the way that I've designed the book and the webinars is that they should work hand in glove. They should work with each other. It's up to you how you want to go about utilizing them. There's two things you can see there on the slide. It's how to use the book and how to use the webinar. Now, firstly, let's just cover cover the book. I wrote the book the way that a lot of military style publications are written. Firstly, you're going to have objectives, you're going to have key points, and you're going to have a self-reflection exercise. So I'll say that again. When you go to each chapter, you'll see the objectives of what I want you to be able to achieve within that chapter, whether it be understanding the probationary period or whether it is understanding the assessment criteria, whether it be understanding CVFs, that will be the objectives that I want you to achieve within that chapter. And it's all designed around what I think you need to know to get into Police Scotland, the minimum amount of information that you need to know to get into Police Scotland. Now, when you go through the book, you'll see a kind of maroon, reddish colour box and it comes up in this webinar later on. And those are the key points. So within each chapter, there is a lot of information, all hand handwritten, but first typed by me in my own writing and from my own experiences and just hopefully written in a kind of funny way, informal. But there is a lot of information. It's a, it is a big old book. But the key point, which is the red box, that just brings it back to you. Now, if you've read that chapter, these are the main points that I want you to remember. If you forget everything, you know, you go into the interview or whatever, and you forget all these bits of information, pages and pages, if you can just remember these bullet points, it'll just help you, it'll jog your memory, and it'll allow you to flow through whatever part you need to do. So, objectives, key points, that's the bulk of information. Now, when it comes to your homework, although it's not homework, it's a self-reflection exercise. There's parts of the book that I've designed that I want you to really engage the brain. So you'll take all this information in, you'll understand the key points, but ultimately I don't know what your situation is. I don't know where you're at currently, type of job, what experiences you've had. This is all about you being able to reflect on the information that I've given you in the book and reflect on where you're at and where you need to what you need to work on to get to where you want to be. You have to do these self-reflection exercises, okay? They're so important. I've taken the time to really think about what it is that you need to be competent at. So if you don't do these self-reflection exercises, you, you'll go into the assessments or you'll go into the interview or you'll do your application and you just might not be covering all the bases. So Make sure you do those self-reflection exercises as well as reading all the information. Make sense? Good. Now, for the book, you can either read it top to toe, right the way through, which I think it would be quite beneficial. But there is it's a big book, so take that into consideration. Or as you progress through the application phases, the, the recruitment process phases, you can work on each chapter or you can refer back to it. So, for example, you're doing your application... Do you need to know about the interview? Probably not at that stage. You can just focus on the application, maybe just read that chapter a couple of times. And then the next stage, you might be going to do your PSET, so you might want to delve into that quite a bit. Then you'll go to your assessment and interviews, and that's when you maybe want to step through those different phases. So it's up to you and how you want to do the book. If you want to read it all the way through, or you want to focus on the chapters that you're currently... Uh, so, for example, you want to focus on the chapters that you're currently at, the stage 
which is equivalent for the process, if that makes sense. Now, how do you use the webinars in conjunction with the book? Well, again, you can either go through each webinar. So, for example, we'll go through the application. You might want to read the book application chapter and then listen to the webinar. Or you might want to read the whole book and then listen to all the webinars. It's up to you, really. I would definitely say when it comes to the assessment and the interview, at that stage, you want to have read the entire book and listened to all the webinars because that's when you really need to have all the information so that you can relay it and it comes out of your mouth in the way that you normally speak so that you come across as genuine and you only get that from just absorbing all the information, reading it, listening to it, living it. And that's when you've you've read all the all the book and all the webinars. Now that's that's everything for this webinar. Like I said, it's a very it's very short, it's very quick. I wanted to just make sure that we took a little bit of time to just discuss the two different stages and how you could progress through the book and how you could progress through the webinars. Now if you've elected to go for the coaching package as well, that will come down the line because the coaching package is structured so that we can discuss the interview. Because that's the thing that most people tend to either fail on, struggle with, or feel that they need just a little bit of confidence going into. Because it can be a, it can be a little bit daunting to walk into that thing having never done it. And when we do the coaching package, we go through a structured interview, we practice it, you get a couple of reflection points, and then you go and ace the interview. So, one more thing. And this goes for the entire book and webinars and coaching package is that when it comes to your own recruitment process, whether it be application, obviously you can't copy the piece set, but whether it be the interview or the assessments, you cannot copy anything that I've used. You really can't. One, from an intellectual copyright point of view. But secondly, and more arguably more importantly from an integrity point of view you're joining police scotland as a police officer one of the values is integrity which you'll learn about if you don't know already and it is possibly the most fundamental value for police officers if you don't understand that then by the time you've read the book and you've listened to the webinars and you will but you cannot copy this it will stand out a country mile to any assessor or police staff that is looking at your application, speaking to you in the interview, or watching you in assessment centres, doing the group exercises. If you utilise any of my examples, copying my stuff, it will stand out a mile, because it won't be genuine, and they the will have just seen how you're acting differently. So, don't copy, bottom line. Perfect. Now we've got that agreement, we can move on to the next webinar. Right, webinar number two, I hope you've got a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, you're comfy because we are about to get into some heavy information. So, we're going to cover information about Police Scotland. Now again, this you can find in chapter two of the book. You can also find it on the Police Scotland website, which is very helpful. It really is. What we're going to go through is the key points from the book, but I'll just be able to expand on it just a little bit more as we chat through. So, let's firstly discuss eligibility. Starting from one, age. We've got here that you have to be 18 in order to join Police Scotland as a police officer. Now, does that mean you have to be 18 when you apply? No, it doesn't. Funny little story. I know an individual that was 17. In fact, he was sat in, believe this, he was sat in uh, higher history, I think it was, when he got a phone in school, school pupil, know that when he got a phone call from the police scotland recruitment team saying listen you've been selected and successful for uh tilly allen starting in about three weeks and he was a school pupil luckily he was 18 a 18 year old school pupil so long story short you can be 17 and a half when you apply does that mean that a lot of teenagers will be successful that's up for debate 
I think the general age of entry is getting lower and lower. But to be a teenager and get into the police, I think that is the exception. Because to get into the police, as we'll discuss down the road in the webinars, you do need to have a considerable amount of life experience. Can you get that when you're 18? Some people do. They absolutely do. Whether they've been a lifeguard, whether they've had to maybe live alone at that age, maybe they've had some traumatic things happen within their family dynamic, and they might be 18, but they could easily present as a 20-odd-year-old. It all depends on the person. I would say getting into the police when you're a teenager, or in fact under 20, is the exception as opposed to the rule. Because generally you need a very vast amount of life experience. It can happen and I certainly wouldn't want to put people off applying. But it's just, it's it's good to know that going in. Now when it comes to body mass, I've got in the book here, there's a very simple thing. If you've never heard of BMI, it's your body mass index. It's essentially a calculation with regarding your height and your weight. So for example, I'm six foot and I weigh normally between 95 up to 103 depending on depending on what's going on I guess um depending on how much running I'm doing so my BMI and to be honest I'm quite a muscular person not blowing my trumpet just it's a fact BMI is actually quite high am I still fit absolutely fit as a fiddle there are certain individuals that I play rugby that are a lot larger than me and fitter than me with a bigger BMI now the BMI isn't a very good reflection on your fitness. It's just a stat of your height and your weight. And it's a general understanding of your fitness. Now, if you are a top-level rugby player, you're a prop, you're 5 foot 8, but you also weigh 24 stone, there is an option where you can get a written letter. Now, don't take this as verbatim, but I know individuals that go into the military via this way, and the police won't be any different. You can get a, a letter written by your doctor or a clinician to specifically provide details on your level of fitness in relation to your BMI. Okay, so if your BMI is over 30, don't take that as a flat out you cannot get in. There's ways around it, but you'd have to engage with the recruitment team to say, look, you know, I've, I've got this issue. My BMI is 36, but I'm a professional rugby player. I'm a shot put player. X, X, X. Don't take this as an absolute full stop and you can't get in there. There are ways around it, okay? If you don't know what BMI is, just Google BMI. You'll see a little chart. You can take your height versus your weight and it'll give you a number. Happy? Let's move on. Eyesight, as we've got there, it's national standard. That won't change. Your nationality, you have to have British citizenship, okay? Or from the foreign national commonwealth so for example you've got a lot of polish nationals that are in police scotland very big presence some other eastern european nationals as well uh, from the eu as well so again don't just think because you're not from the uk that that's stopping you from getting in that absolutely will take people in from those areas as well now the driving license this one this one comes up uh, time and time again And it it tends to flip-flop. Sometimes it will be, you have to have a driving license, full, manual, flat, full stop. But, as of 2022, you were required to have a full driving license. Now, if you go back to when I joined, 2016, that wasn't the case. I know individuals, I know individuals that joined without a driving license. So the current standard, 2022 onward, so we're in 2024 just now, 2022 onwards you need a a driving license always check the website if it changes sometimes it depends on the recruitment figures if they're struggling to recruit then they might drop the standard and their driving license might be one of the standards they drop this is just a little bit of information if you've never experienced or understood what vetting is obviously i'm in the military joined the police I've went through enhanced vetting several occasions through recruitment processes and promotions. You will be vetted if you join the police. If you have ever been involved in the police, that will show up there, whether you're a witness, a victim, suspect, or accused. But it also goes further, and they do enhanced vetting, which covers 
quite a wide variety to your parents. I can't remember how far it goes, but it certainly goes past your parents as well. I think if I can just give you a broad brush understanding of vetting is that if you have anything that you think you have to declare, then declare it. Because it's better to declare something than not declare something and it come out anyway. Because they will find out the systems that they're able to do vetting on. They go back many years and they're very deep. So it's not for you to get concerned too much, but just have a good understanding that vetting is a thing and you will have to go through that. Any other questions, you, again... And you'll hear this a lot through the webinar, but just contact the, the Police Scotland recruitment team because they are your first port of call for all that detailed information regarding recruitment, okay? So, that was kind of dull stuff, you know, hopefully you, you knew all that stuff anyway if you're going through this process. Now we can get into a little bit more interesting stuff. So, you're wanting to join as a police officer, correct? I hope you're saying correct there. Well, as you'll know, joining the police is both a physically tasking job, it's also mentally tasking. And you require to have certain levels of skills or be able to reflect certain levels of skills, both from the application phase and the recruitment process, so your, your actual application through the assessment centre, the interview, through Tilly Allen to actually doing the job. There's an expectation that police officers have a certain level of skill and certain types of skills. And as you can see, they're on the screen there. Now, I'm sure you can read, so I'm not going to go through them massively in depth. But if you go back to the book, I go into a lot of information all about these different skills in way, way, way more detail, okay? So, for example, let's just cover the first one, which is demonstrate a realistic appreciation of the roles and duties of a police officer. So, during the interview, you have to be able to explain an understanding of the role of the police officer and duties you can be expected to carry out. Aim to understand what you will be required to do on a typical day, okay? So, that's your police officer skills, a realistic appreciation of the roles and duties of the police officer. So that is just what the police officers do. What do they actually do? You will only find this out if you read the book, listen to webinars, but also speak to police officers. What do you actually do? Do you just jail people all the time? No, you don't actually do that. It's, they do a lot of different things as well. So what do they do? Well, they'll go in the morning, they'll get a briefing, they'll get specific taskings, You'll have an individual workload of crimes and incidents that you've got to resolve. And then you've got to listen to the radio. And when I say radio, I mean your, your walkie-talkie, if you want to call it that. It's called the radio, though. For any urgent and immediate calls that you've got to go to. But that's just response police officers. There's so many different departments that have different responsibilities all across the crime, people-focused, keeping people safe realm. Now for these police officer skills, you need to have a good understanding of them. There's a lot more information in the book. I go into quite a bit of detail for them. And I'm just going to pick out one or two more of these police officer skills which I think are most relevant. So number six is problem solving. This will show up time and time again, whether it be in your application, the assessment centre, or the interview. You need to be able to show and demonstrate that you have problem solving skills. You'll have to demonstrate that at Tilly Allen, but you have to demonstrate that before you even get there. The assessment centre is all about problem solving and decision making. But the majority of the exercises, you're solving a problem. That's kind of what you do. Now, those problems will change and they'll be different. But you need to be solution-focused, not just pointing out the obvious, not just pointing out the problem, trying to think of different solutions. 
And when you do that, there'll be a lot of other people thinking, I know how to do that. I'm going to solve this problem. But you, reflecting back to number five, need to be emotional and resilient. Emotional resilient. You need to be able to stand there, come up with a problem, give some good clear communication, and then make a decision. One I want to highlight as well is the effective teamwork and skills, which relates to problem solving and your emotional resilience. Being a police officer, you have to be absolutely okay with working as part of a team. Now, teams are different sizes. Teams are team of two, team of five, team of ten. You'll find yourself working in, even in a single day, working as various different teams. Whether it be, like I said, a team of two, you and your double up out in the car, that's a team. But you're also working as a part of a team for your shift. You're also working as part of a team for your geographical area, whether it be your uh, your council or just your local area. Or you might be part of a dedicated team, whether it be you know a CID team or whatever it is. Being able to talk about team work in the application, the assessment centre and interview is key because you need to be a team player. Not just showing that you've been part of a team, but how you successfully were part of a team, how you brought that team on, your contribution. These are things you need to start thinking about. And another one I just want to not talk about too much because we will discuss it is number three, highest levels of personal integrity. That goes back to webinar number one when I said, listen, you can't copy me. Integrity, integrity, integrity. But integrity is absolutely fundamental. As a police officer, you'll learn this throughout this entire process that this is one of the biggest values, the most important values and one that you have to, again, talk about in your application assessment centre and interview. Now you're going to hear me saying that again and again and again on things but it's just so obvious for me because it's I understand what the recruitment process wants to see. It doesn't want to see the finished article. It just wants to see that you have potential. That's something you have to remember. So we've talked about the police skills now let's talk a bit about police knowledge. So, Police Scotland. What is Police Scotland? Well, Police Scotland is a service, not a force, it's a service, and they police from consent. Now, if you've never heard of what policing by consent means, this is a great thing to be able to drop in in either the uh, assessment centre or the interview. It's actually sounds it's actually quite it's quite a funny term because you almost take it for granted but police Scotland is the police force because the public the populace agrees to it that is what policing by consent means it means that the population consent to police Scotland being the force that carries out the criminal investigation the keeping people safe the roles of the police service that's what that means if you can drop that in in the assessment centre interview, you're onto you're onto gold dust there. Now, just to cover, I'm I'm assuming that you'll know this, but just to cover it very briefly again, all the information's in the book. Police Scotland is a, was is established was established back in twenty thirteen. I've got fourteen there, but I think it's thirteen. And this was brought about by the amalgamation of 13 different police forces into one, into one single force. This is then brought about, ultimately creating the second biggest force just behind the Met in the UK. Hands down, an amazing piece of change management, which is just a management term thing. Now, the way that Police Scotland works is that it has a single force, but it also has 
specialist divisions that support the entire force. So, for example, you've got each division, which is Police Scotland splitting up the geographical areas, tends to be the council areas, into the divisions. So, for example, D Division, it's Dundee, or Tayside, you're say. Uh, G Division, Glasgow, E, Edinburgh, A for Aberdeen, etc. P for Fife. Now, all these divisions are supported by specialist divisions. And that will be your major incident team. That will be your specialist support teams, such as your search teams. It could be also just the specialist crime divisions, essentially your, your specialised CID teams. Within there, you'll also have organised crime, counter-terrorism units, firearms, public order units, and mountain branches and things like that. So all these different divisions support the local divisions. And all these divisions, ultimately, Police Scotland, is led by a single police officer, the Chief Constable. Now, I'm not going to go on to who the Chief Constable is, because that changes it changes very frequently, to be fair. But you've got a Chief Constable, a Deputy Chief Constable, Assistant Chief Constables, and so on and so on. Now, one thing to note is that back in you know, 2013, each uh, police service within Scotland had its own chief constable so that's going from over 13 down to one chief constable so that's a big function functional change at the command and control level not something that you'll probably have to discuss throughout this because that's going back quite a while now but certainly one thing to be considerate of is just the major events that Police Scotland has now taken care of. So COP26 is actually something I was involved in in the planning team uh, for the, the North East. So that is possibly the biggest coming together of external organisations, so essentially different countries, but it brought about the biggest policing requirement in modern history. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of attendees, over two hundred different different heads of state, and it was regarded as the biggest single deployment of police officers in the history of modern policing. So that just shows you Police Scotland's ability to be able to police major, major events. They've also dealt with the Commonwealth Games, but that, that's going back a little bit now. But certainly, want to refer back to if it comes up is the COP26, the Climate Conference. So what we want to talk about just now is the opportunities for development as a police officer. Just so you've got that in your head should it come up. So obviously, first and foremost, your requirement is to show competent as a responsive police officer. That is, that is your primary duty. When you join up, you'll need to show, show that you're able to do the job as a police officer. Response. Now, when I joined, yeah, happy to do that, but I always wanted to be in the CID. That's just what I wanted to do. Went in there with a the game plan. I'm going to get in there early. Luckily, I was able to get in the CID after two years and two months or something like that. Literally just up my probation. Now, again, that is not the norm. It happens a little bit more often. But I was the youngest, not the youngest person, but the shortest time to get, or the quickest time to get into the CID is what I'm trying to say in uh, D Division history. Two years and two months or so. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but that is not to say that you cannot achieve something similar. If you are just desperate to get into the traffic, road policing, CID, firearms, you know, your world, your oyster there. And I would certainly say going into joining Police Scotland, just remember that there's a multitude of different roles out there outside of response policing. And if you're keen, you're capable, 
and you want to get after it, then it's absolutely it's, it's yours for the taking. Okay. So again, if you're talking talking about development opportunities when it comes to the interview, just be cognizant or be be aware. Cognizant just means be aware that you could say, yeah, listen, I want to be a police officer, a response police officer, I want to show that I could do the job, but I understand that there are opportunities out there to either move into a specialist department once I've got more experience. Job done. That's what they want to hear. Now, something that will come up potentially in the assessment centre or in your interview is about the change in dynamic, right? This is a great phrase, not for the interview, but just I love this phrase, the only constant is change, okay? The only constant is change. That means the only thing that stays consistent is the fact that we change all the time. doesn't matter what organisation you work in, that happens all the time. And being in Police Scotland, being a police officer, that is no different. And I was in for six years, in that space of time, legislation changed, the use of notebooks changed, the way that we police changed, everything changed and it has done and it will keep doing that so as long as you're content to constantly develop your knowledge develop your understanding of processes and procedures then you'll be fine if you get stuck in your ways and you don't want to learn new things and understand new ways of doing things then you will struggle i'll just be honest with you now when it comes to the the interview you may have to discuss you know tell me something about police scotland that's new or in the in the uh, assessment centre, they may discuss topical topics. Now, if you can stay current with the developments in Police Scotland, that will benefit you massively. And we'll cover a couple of new technologies and stuff here. So for your awareness, the way that Police Scotland is changing, and has changed very recently, they've changed from paper notebooks where you write down a statement, to electronic notebooks. It looks like a big, like a small tablet, big big phone there is a massive technology improvement no longer are you just writing on a piece of paper now you're electronically writing it or typing it it's stored digitally digitally straight to the cloud so there's no chance of you losing it within that same device you can access all the police systems that you need so you could check people's names you could check their history you could do a quick search that single improvement is a, is a game changer and you can talk about that all day long in the assessment centre or interview. Another way that they're changing is the rollout of body-worn cameras. Now that this might come up if you get a group discussion assessment centre exercise. They may say something like, discuss the use of body-worn cameras for Police Scotland, the good and the bad. Something like that, maybe. So what is your thoughts? Body-worn cameras, good, bad, indifferent? Let's just cover it very quickly. Body-worn cameras is a great initiative. It's essentially your ability to get corroboration without somebody else being there. You interact with the member of the public. It's f you're, you're only human and you f can forget things or you might not catch things. If they say it very quick or they've got a thick accent. You hit that camera on, it's recording straight away. Anything they say is recorded. Anything that happens is recorded. You know, they attack you, they punch you, you have to use force, cuff them, and then they say, I didn't do anything. Well, it's on camera. Perfect. It can capture people's mannerisms, their behaviour, their tone. That could be so powerful when it comes to court. Body-worn cameras are your friend. The naysayers would say it's an invasion of privacy. That's got that's got a point. The way you get around that is by informing the member of the public. My body-worn camera is on. It's going to capture anything you say, just so you're aware. It's quite big, obviously. It's got a little light. draws people's attention. They'll know that it's switched on. So there's lots of different things that you can talk about from a positive point of view. And a negative point of view, but answering those negative questions when it comes to body-worn cameras. Key thing for you, two big technology improvements. The use of electronic notebooks and the rollout of body-worn cameras. Two big things. 
Another thing that is for your awareness, it might come up, depends on, on how you want to answer questions, is the closing of police stations. So in the paper it will say police stations closing everywhere. Okay, fine. But what's actually happening is that they're pooling resources. So instead of having four remote little police units, little stations that don't really get occupied, they might just push that into one larger unit that is utilised by those officers that work in those small four ones. What people don't realise is that these units tend not to be actually occupied. So again, just a bit of information for what you need to know is that they're pulling police stations into local, larger areas. Okay. What we've got here. So we've got information that we're going to cover about the probationary period, but we'll get to that in a second. Something that you need to know is Police Scotland's focus and Police Scotland's values. Two separate things, okay? I'll be honest, these might be hard for you to remember in the heat of battle if you're in the interview. Do you absolutely need to remember its focus verbatim? It will be helpful because you might get asked it. If you can, get post-it notes or write it down in a notebook, stick it on your wall just remember, Police Scotland's focus, keeping people safe. Keeping people safe. Okay? Values. What are the values? Fairness, integrity, respect, and human rights. Now, fairness, integrity, and respect is how I remember it. You might remember it. Integrity, fairness, and respect. Respect, fairness, and integrity. Just write it down somewhere so you can keep saying it again and again. Now, is just remembering those three words enough? No. Because you'll have to explain them and hopefully you explain them when you're doing your interview. Hopefully it comes up time and time again when you're giving your examples that you're discussing how you were fair. You're discussing how you showed integrity. In the assessment you're displaying respect. and You might discuss respect and what it means to you. So write them down, know them, but understand that you will have to speak about them as well. But don't worry, because we're going to come up, come into that on the webinars later on. So, now let's discuss the two-year training program, which is your probation. Okay? So, let's just imagine you've passed everything. You've gotten in, you're at Tully Allen. Okay? It doesn't actually start at Tully Allen, your two-year two two probation, because you've got some stuff to do before you even get there. So, this is really important. For you to know what you're getting yourself into, but also you could easily get asked this question during the interview. Tell me about the probationary training program. Tell me about the two-year training program. Now, you might get caught off guard if they say two-year training program and you just think of probation. So make sure you just understand what this actually means. It means you're getting trained for two years. And you're getting trained in different ways. So let's cover it. So before you even get to Tilly Allen, you'll have to do just some, they're called Moodle online training packages. It's basically just some stuff that you do online to get you prepped. It might be a little bit of understanding of the values, making sure that they're fresh in your head. Cover some other sort of criteria, maybe some health and safety stuff as well. It's all designed to limit the time that you have to be residential at Tilly Allen, as in that reduces the time that you've actually got to live at Tilly Allen. So you've done that a couple of weeks before you go. Now you're at Tilly Allen. You're going to be there for 12 weeks. Now you'll cover, I've got a list of things here that you'll cover, deliverable units, your operational first aid, your operational safety training, which is your, your baton, your spray, your cuffs. You'll cover Scots criminal law, your policing powers and principal evidence, Scots criminal law introduction and investigation, health and well-being for cops, your protection and well-being, general policing duties, search training, road policing, which is traffic, and your organisational awareness. 
Now this will all be squashed in around drill, around a couple of cloth inspections and equipment inspections, training around the quality and diversity, just a lot and lot of stuff. There's some information out there about Tilly Allen. I wouldn't get too concerned about it. It's an enjoyable thing as long as you lean into it, as long as you just embrace it, as long as you just accept I'm here for three months. Once that's done, I'll never really have to do a course like this again. You might have to do a one-week course here, there and everywhere, but you won't have to do 12 weeks again. Go there, smile. You'll be able to see my name on the wall for earning the baton. Just, uh, just, just brag in there, if I'm honest. And you'll just, you'll enjoy it. I guarantee you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, tough. You're there for 12 weeks. <laughs> now... Once you've uh, once you've done all that, once you've done Tilly Allen, you've done your 12 weeks there, you're then going to go to, and by the way, there's more information in the book about Tilly Allen that I've written, so make sure you read that. You'll then go to divisional training, which just means going, if you're from Glasgow, you'll go to a place in Glasgow, you'll do one week, sometimes a week and a half. There you just learn things about your G division, or D division, or P division, wherever it is. You'll learn how to use the local applications of how you record crime. You'll learn the general Police Scotland applications of how you record incidents or VPDs or just different types of things. They'll maybe give you a fitness test, if I can't recall. You'll get a tour of the headquarters, a tour of the custody. You'll get given all the information that you need, basic information, that you need to know to operate in that area. Like I said, one week, sometimes two. Next is then when you actually go to work. It's called the operational phase. And from there, it takes you all the way up to the point where you've completed your probation. Now, is it just a case that you're there and you just you just work for you know a year and a half? No, that's not quite the case. Throughout that operational phase, you'll still get your tests. So you're going to get fitness tests. You're going to have to do an electronic portfolio of evidence, an EPE. Now that terminology might change, just understand it's a portfolio. What is that? It's essentially questions on different crimes that you go to. Maybe it changes by division, but essentially it's just a portfolio you've got to do. You'll also get other tests. So you'll get an oral test where you have to relay verbatim different terminologies, whether it be what is a robbery, what is an assault, Give me the definition of this, this, and this. And you have to literally say it out loud. Sometimes you get recorded. Sometimes there's two people watching you. It's a challenging test. And then there's a couple of other tests. Just a generic test. Um, and then a, a concluding test. Are they challenging? I don't think they, are, they were. If I'm brutally, brutally honest. I think a lot of people can find it difficult to study in and around actually working. So being at Tully Allen full time, you're just studying all the time because you're just there. The operational phase is easy to just, you know, you live at home, you might be married with children, you might have a partner, a dog, whatever, and you're still working full time and living your life. And then all of a sudden you've got to go do these tests as well. That can be quite challenging for people. So that was quite a lot of information there. Did you retain all that? What is the two year probationary period. Well, it's in a nutshell, some learning prior to getting to Tilly Allen, 12 weeks residential training at Tilly Allen, followed by divisional training, which is a week, sometimes two, and then an operational phase, which takes you up to the end of your probation. Now, within that, you should be able to talk about all the different things I said there. That concludes webinar two there's a lot of information I've covered there, okay? There really, really is. And I'm just kind of covering that off the top of my head. So make sure you do go back to the book just to cement that information. There's also a self-reflection exercise, number two, okay? Which specifically tasks you to challenge yourself by answering the questions of the things we've discussed. Make sure you do that because... If you just skip the self-reflection exercises, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> no, it does. Of course it bothers me because I want you to, to be successful. 
but you're just going to stab yourself in the foot because it's going to, you're going to make it more difficult for you when you get to the interview, okay? So make sure you do that self-reflection exercise number two. And I'll see you in webinar three. Okay, and webinar number three, which is going to be the Code of Ethics and Values. Please, Scotland Values. Now, hopefully you're listening to this prior to doing your application and prior, obviously, to the Assessment Centre and interview. Now, the Code of Ethics and Police Scotland values are really integral to the application and the Assessment Centre and the interview. Being able not just to relay what the values are, as in just remember them, but being able to discuss them from first-hand experience, being able to clearly show them during the application, in your writing, being able to actually just embody them and display them in each group exercise is really, really important. It's really important that you have a good sense, not of them, but what they mean to you. Really, really what they mean to you. Now, you don't have to be able to write a book about them, but you need to be able to just summarise them and sum them up in your own words because if you, if you were to say them in somebody else's words, it just shows. If you were to do a 45-minute interview, and when it comes to the, the values question, you, your, your voice changes a bit and you, you're speaking in a different way because you're just remembering what either I said or somebody else said, it just comes across as ingenuine. So being able to talk about them from a first-hand point of view, a first POV, really, really important. Okay, with that out of the way, let's discuss them. So, the Code of Ethics, the Police Scotland values, the respect, integrity, fairness, and human rights, not human, silly me. So, what do they mean? What, what do they mean? Well, we'll get to that self-reflection point of view for you later on. What do they mean to me? Well, when I did the application, I made sure that when I did the actual application, the written application... I had these dripped in to every, either I, would, I talked massively about integrity in one question or fairness in another or maybe a combination of them in some of the bigger questions and definitely when it came to the interview I might have answered a question specifically about, I don't know, communication skills with a diff- difficult customer or something but I talked about respect, I made sure I mentioned fairness and I probably sprinkled in some integrity there as well. So from the book, if you've got the book open or if you've read the book so far, you'll be able to see that I've got a couple of sentences for each of them. So for example, integrity. Integrity. I recognise my role in policing as being a symbol of public faith and trust and the obligation it places upon me to act with integrity, fairness and respect. I shall behave in a way which reflects the values of policing in Scotland. I understand I am personally responsible for my own actions and will appropriately exercise my discretion, and so on and so on. I've put them in there so that you can maybe just select a couple, maybe some of them just stick in your head a little bit more than others, but take the time to read through them. Because if you don't have a good understanding of what respect means in a policing context, then these will definitely hammer it home. And that's that's fine. If you understand what integrity means to you, but maybe not what it would mean to a police officer, read these, because this will be able to relate to you. Now, what we're going to now cover is the human rights. Again, I don't I don't know what your background is, what level of education you have, or what awareness you have had with human rights. But when it comes to policing, certainly when you're at Tully Allen, you'll have to explain this. But we discussed the European Convention of Human Rights. And that is where your fundamental rights as a human are derived from. So an example of Article 2 right to life. You need to be able to just discuss that at Tilly Allen, don't worry about it for the application, but have a good understanding of where the, 
what is a human right? Where are they coming from? These are coming from the European Convention of Human Rights, and there's different articles which cover your independent, independent individual human rights. So what we're going to discuss now. When you go to the book, I've specifically drawn out a couple of questions for each one of the values and provided an answer. So I'm just going to go through them. Some people like to read, some people like to listen. Hopefully a combination of both of these ways gets it really into your head what you need to know. So let's start with integrity, the integrity question. Question, what does integrity mean as a police officer? Answer. As a police officer, you are placed in a position of trust and by the very nature of that position, you must at all times act with the highest level of integrity. That means acting as a role model to the communities we police and it means delivering a professional policing service to the communities and not being seen to be impartial in any way. Acting with integrity also extends beyond our interactions with the public and into interactions with colleagues, as in other police officers and any other policing partners such as emergency staff. Ultimately, for me, acting with integrity is about doing the right thing at all times. That's a great line. Ultimately, it means doing the right thing at all times, even when no one's looking. In my current job as a store assistant, I've made that up, I show high levels of integrity when handling money for my company. My company relies on me to carry out the correct checks on all levels of the finances and report any inaccuracies. Or you could say, I show high levels of integrity in my current employment as an office manager when handling personal data. In my role, I have to take, uh, I have to take and store customer clients' details and secure the sensible data, and act with integrity when protecting it. So there's a couple of different ways that you could skin an integrity question. What does it mean as a police officer? You'd relay the generic information that I've given you there and then come at it with a personal point of view of how you actually show it. And I guarantee you, doesn't matter what job you do, you show levels of integrity. What I've kind of wanted to get across there is that when we talk about, you know, people think about integrity of being money, you know, you make sure that you count the money correctly and you, you store that, but people's data, people's data is, is, is a form of, it's a form of currency, it's a form of um, something you could sell. And it's very personal, so making sure that you handle that with sound integrity is really, really a good explanation as well. Let's discuss the fairness question. So, the question is, how does fairness impact on your duties as a police officer? I'll say that again. How does fairness impact on your duties as a police officer? Answer. Well, as a police officer, you'll be required to interact with people of all cultures, all different religious backgrounds, nationalities, political beliefs, and many others. But it's imperative that everyone is given the same access to our services and provided the same professional delivery, regardless of their background. And equally, on a larger scale, it's also important that communities are also given the same equal policing service and impartiality. I... If I am selected as a police officer, I'm going to ensure that I deliver my duties in a fair and impartial manner as a police officer. I reflect this value, this is when you go back to what you're doing just now, and I reflect this value in my current employment as a traffic warden, where I'm public facing and I interact with members of the public of all backgrounds of and of all society levels. I make sure I deliver a fair service, an impartial service, and strive to provide the customer which is the public, member of the public, the best interactions with me and my wider organisation. So again, the first half of that question, we just talk about what we think fairness is for a police officer and then relay it back to whatever job you're doing just now. Just discuss how you're actually fair as well. Now let's discuss a respect question.
So Police Scotland carry out their duties by policing the communities by consent, meaning they do so by the agreement of the communities and by the public. And as part of that duty, they interact with all members of society, with people of all different backgrounds and beliefs, and all different members of society deserve the same level of respect from the police service. The level of respect shall also apply to detained people. As a police officer, you'll need to ensure that your actions and interactions with colleagues are carried out with respect at the centre of any actions. I reflect this value when volunteering for, just enter a charity or an organisation you work for. But here's an example of how you'd structure that. And this charity deals with homeless members of society. Many of the people I assist have alcohol and drug dependencies and can be very difficult to basically engage with. I make sure that I treat each person with respect, which actually makes my job easier as they start to open up to me they start to communicate better to me. I've learnt through experience that showing respect to an individual can lead to a more pleasant and productive interaction for them and for me. So that would just be an answer to a question regarding respect. Let's cover a human rights question now. In what way should police officers consider human rights when going about their duties? Again, question. In what way should police officers consider human rights when going about their duties? Answer. Every person, regardless of background, has prescriptive human rights granted to them. These rights are laid out in the European Convention of Human Rights. And as a police officer, I'm also granted human rights. My role will require me to uphold the human rights of members of the public in all aspects of my duties. But I understand that my role as a police officer may put me in a position where I have to deprive or deny a person of one of these aspects of the human rights. When I do so, and by the way, that would be something like the right to liberty, so that would be arresting them. When I do so, I will only do when lawful and necessary. This information has been taken from the Police Scotland website and explained in my own understanding, okay? So that stuff there you can actually find on the website or that question there, but I've put it into my own phraseology. I've adapted it so that it reflects the generic information and makes it a little bit more uh, personal for you at the end. Now, what's really, really, really important You've got your values, respect, integrity, fairness, and human rights. These need to show up. These need to show up from the application onwards until you retire in 30 years. You need to show it in your application that you're embodying these values and that you display these values. You need to show it in the interview and you need to show it during the assessment centre exercises. You need to then show it at Tully Allen all day long. You need to then show it at your divisional training you need to then show it in your operational phase and then when you're out your probation, you have to still show it. Members of the public are becoming more demanding. The media is becoming more demanding. And rightly so, that police officers continue to show the highest levels. That's a good way to remember it. The highest levels of respect, integrity and fairness and the display of human rights. Homework time. So, self-reflection exercise number three. It's all about questions for you. Explain what respect as a value means to you and how do you display this currently in your life? That's a question. Explain what integrity means to you and how you display this currently in your life. Explain what fairness means to you and how you display this currently in your life. A couple more after that as well. Make sure you do, do those questions. Don't just, don't faff it. Actually, sit down Look at that question, you know, close the door and just speak it out loud. Try your best to speak it out loud. If you speak it out loud and you faff it and you stumble over your words, like I've been stumbling over my words in this webinar, <laughs> if you stumble over your words, it's better to do it in the privacy of your room than to do it during the interview. So practice, 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 and I'll see you in the next webinar. Okay, and now we are into webinar number four, the application. The previous webinars, they've all been basic information, they've all been 
foundational information, but from now on, from this stage onwards, this is starting to get into the areas where it's assessable, where you are about to be assessed. And from this stage forward, you are going to have to start to show just how you are a suitable candidate for the position of police officer in Police Scotland. From now on, this is what you are showing. And you're going to be tested, you're going to be assessed, and in this stage, you're going to be assessed via your application. So it's really, really important to start off by saying, this is your time to shine. This is your time. You'll have seven questions, as as we'll talk about. You're going to have seven questions to be able to show that you're a suitable candidate to be a police officer, to start in that probationary period, you are going to be a suitable person. This is not a time to be reserved. This is not a time to hold back and not fully explain all the different successes you've had and areas that you've overcome and areas that you've developed to be a suitable candidate. This is the time to show that. That absolutely is. So as you can see there, you will have seven different questions with different word counts. We'll come into each question individually, but what is it? It's a question for yourself. What is it you're going to have to show in each one of these questions or throughout the entire application? There's two big things. One, it's going to be showing that you're a suitable candidate to be a police officer. And two, you're going to have to show the policing values, respect, integrity, fairness, human rights. Number two is a question specifically on them, but you're still going to have to show them in other questions as well. Okay, Make sure that you're dripping that into there. Now, the questions can change from time to time, but these are the most recent questions. The, The phraseology might change slightly, or the entire question might change, but this is what it's currently at in 2024. I'll drink of my coffee there. So let's get into them. Let's go through each question one by one again. Integrity, the officer's code here. Don't copy these. It will show up. If you copy it, it will stand out a country mile. And you you're, you just won't be taken any further, okay? So don't do it. So, if you look at the book, I've kind of covered a couple of different verbiages, a couple of different phrases. So if it says things like, please provide, it means offer. Please describe, it means actually give the detail, actually give the actual detail. Or again, please provide is just giving, just just giving it across. So make sure you read the question well. So let's start off with question number one, which is please provide a personal statement in relation to your application for police officer, 400 to 500 words. Now, if if you've ever went to uni or or if you've ever had to apply for a job where it says give a personal statement, you'll have experience doing that. If you've not, then it's time to get experience. You can easily Google, search, YouTube, I don't know, TikTok maybe as well, personal statement, how to write one, how to really get it across there. And that's great. It'll give you some hints, tips, things, ways to structure it. Remember, remember it's only 500 words. But what's really important is you can take all that information, but you have to make it personal. Okay? This is the this is the classic question that you'll get for applying to do a degree, you know, talking about a personal statement. But this question is quite vague. Please provide a personal statement in relation to your application for police officer. What is this getting at? What do you think it's getting at? For me, this is getting at, why do you want to be a police officer? It doesn't say that because that's almost too much of a simple question. It's just saying, tell us, give us a personal statement about your application. You know, why do you want to join? What stages of life have you went through that's, that's brought you to here? What they want to hear, what they want to hear is, is, a, is a couple of different things. 
And it doesn't have to just be about, I want to be a police officer. I certainly wouldn't write it like that. I wouldn't say, I certainly wouldn't start out, I have always wanted to be a police officer. I don't think that comes across very well. What they want to hear, they want to hear some of the classic things, and I've written them in the book. They want to hear things about you wanting to serve the community or your community. You want to work for a large, disciplined organisation. They want to hear that you think the Police Scotland have got great career developments and opportunities. They want to hear about your desire to be part of something bigger than yourself, a force for good, an organisation for good. They want to hear and they want to understand that you've got similar values to them. And I say them as Police Scotland, so they want to hear that you've got values of respect, integrity, fairness. You uphold human rights. They want to hear in your personal statement that you want to help people. Because as a police officer, you don't just arrest people, you help people. They want to hear that you want to be a force for good in your community. You've always wanted to be, you've had good morality. You've known your rights and your wrongs and you want to help and be a good force in the community. They want to hear... You know, that you have always wanted to be a police officer, but don't start with that. Maybe put that in halfway through if you if you want to put that in, if it's personal to you. They want to hear that you've had a, you know, an interaction with the police potentially, whether it be good or bad. And that you feel that you can follow on that good interaction and you want to be part of it. Or you've had a bad interaction with the police. Or you've been involved in something with the police before. It might have been a negative thing in your life, maybe with a family member, and you've thought, no, I, I want to be a force for good. I want to either change the way that interaction happened, I want to make sure nobody else has to go through something like that, or if they do, I want to be there to support them. Okay. So these are the things that they want to hear in your personal statement, but it has to be personal to you, because you might get asked this in, in the interview as well, and you have to be able to talk about it off the cuff. And you can only do that if it's actually personal to you. So we'll go over that again very briefly. Question one, please provide a personal statement in relation to your application for police officer. Up to 500 words. What they want to hear is, they want to hear about what's brought you to want to be a police officer. And what is it about you that kind of makes you a good option to be a police officer? What are your actual values over and above Fairness, integrity, respect. What things do you want to do? What drives you to be just desiring to be a police officer? Write it about yourself, okay? In the book, uh, I go through a couple of different things. You can brainstorm. You can literally just write down personal statement in the middle. Underline police officer. Think about why you want to join the police. What skills do you have? Are you a great communicator? Do you love problem solving? Do you love interacting with members of the community? Do you love just helping people? Do you hate seeing people get away? Genuinely, if you hate seeing criminals get away with with crime, basically. And what experiences have you had in life that have made you think that way or feel that way? Talk about it from a personal point of view. Remember, you've only got 500 words, so you can't go into too much detail, and I suggest you don't go into too much detail. Make sure it's personal. It's a personal statement. Talk from the heart. But remember some of the the core values of a police officer, and the skills as well. Remember those policing skills. In the book, I have also mentioned that you want to... You want to make it punchy, you want to make it attention grabbing. Don't list all your qualifications, you know, etc, etc. Really read all the information that I've put across there. And I've given you an example of my personal statement. It is personal. It talks about my family history. It talks about my previous military service, which was previous to when I joined the police. And how that, I think that makes me a good candidate. How service to the country is service to a community and how I want to keep that going. It's personal to me and it makes sense. So make sure it's personal for you. Okay, question two. P.S. Police Scotland. 
Values are fairness, integrity, respect and human rights. What values are important to you and how do you practice these values in your own life? 200 words. So it's less than half for uh, the first question. 200 words is not a lot of words. It really, really isn't, okay? So will you be able to discuss fairness, integrity, respect and human rights in detail in 200 words? No. You're potentially going to have to amalgamate them into just values, okay? If that makes sense. We've already discussed in the previous webinar the Code of Ethics and we've deep dived into fairness, integrity and respect and the human rights. So hopefully you've done the exercise, the self-reflection exercise and you, you know about them. But this is a time for you to really talk about what values are important to you. Like what values do you think are important to you? But also how you demonstrate them. So for example... If you want to talk specifically about your integrity because your workplace requires a high level of integrity, whatever that is, you could do that. If you, I don't know, if you show fairness because you work for a charity or you volunteer somewhere, talk about that. But ultimately, Police Scotland's values are fairness, integrity, respect, human rights. What values are important to you? You want to make sure that you're embodying these values as well. Now again, I have talked about in detail, have I, is it 200 words I've done in the example? Let me just check. Yeah. So I've given an example. Again, it's personal to me as a military officer in the Royal Air Force. I made sure that I talk about showing respect, showing integrity, showing fairness and human rights. And I've brought out in bold, make sure you read it, uh, I've highlighted certain areas in bold that just talks, just really highlights, really cements the actual Police Scotland values. So make sure you read that one and then just have one for yourself. Question three, please describe your own development journey and how this has helped shape you. This could be educational achievements at school, college, university or other vocational training and work experience. Now, some people might look at question three and say, well, that's question one, is it not? Well, no, it's not. Question one's all about what has brought you to be a police officer, okay? Please provide a personal statement about your application for police officer. Question three is asking you about your journey. They're similar, but they are separate. They're different. The way I see the development journey question, question three, is there's a start. It's not a finish, but there's a present. Okay, question three is about what has developed you in your journey, okay, and how has it shaped you? Now, everybody's different because some people might have went just to, you know, just to school. You might be one of those lucky few that are applying at 18 years old. You've only done high school and that, that's all you know. But there'll be others, other things in there and we'll discuss that. Some people might be 25 and they've done university. They've maybe got a first-time job and they're thinking, listen, I want to do something bigger, better, and a little bit more interesting. So that's where you're at. You might be 45. You might have two kids. You might be married. You might be single. You might have a dog. You're at a different stage in life. You could be 52. Somebody went through training with me and they were in their 50s, easily in their 50s. Um, 53, I think it was. He's got grandkids. Very much a different stage of life. And that's a development journey. Has that person developed over time? Yeah, they have. Has the person that's 18 developed over time? Absolutely. So that's why it says this could be from educational achievements at school, college, university, or beyond for your work experience. So again, it doesn't say it specifically, but you have to sprinkle in there the values of fairness, integrity, fairness... I'll start again. You need to sprinkle in the values of fairness, integrity, respect and human rights. I'm speaking too fast here. So I've got an answer and I'll just read it out loud because it's this is quite a good one I think. It's obviously, please describe your own development journey and how this has helped shape you. 
With my constant desire to learn new skills and lifelong learning, I decided to go to university to study sports science. This is made up, by the way. I didn't do that. This is just an example to help you. This course has been integral to my development, both from an academic perspective and personal perspective. Now, what that talks about, I'll just quickly interrupt myself, is that being a police officer, you need to have lifelong learning. You need to be showing that you're committed to do some learning, as in going to Tilly Allen and your two-year probation, and that can, you know, for after thereafter, you're still going to be learning focused. So that's what I've already explained in that first bit. I have gained valuable knowledge from the subject, but more importantly, I have developed my communication and interpersonal skills. Again, this is what you need to do because at Tully Allen, you'll get knowledge, you'll get crime knowledge, you'll get all that good stuff, but you also have to be able to develop your communication and interpersonal skills as well. That's why I wrote that. The course is very practical and I focused on the coaching aspect, which allowed me to enhance my ability to speak clearly and concisely to people of all ages and differing backgrounds. Hey, what we got there? We got a little bit of respect, a little bit of fairness there sprinkled in. Again, this is just, I've wrote this specifically, okay? If you read, take the time to read this, anybody that looks at that can then relay that and think, oh, wow, this individual's done all this doing a sports science degree. This is all very much applicable to being a police officer. So, moving on. Further, through work experience through the local council at sports and education, as a sports and education coach, I have gained an understanding of how the local authority works and how it works with partner agencies. I've been able to work in various teams through the work through this work experience, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. My development journey through education and work experience has provided me a skill set that is transferable to the role of police officer. In addition, I am fully confident in my ability and feel ready for the future as a police officer. So, that second paragraph, it talks about uh, the actual practical experience of working in a local council, which is great. The, the person has gained an understanding of how the authority works, the local authority, so they understand how the structure of an, a council works and how that's, that single council works with partner agencies, which is so important as a police officer. As a police officer, you don't just deal with everything by yourself, you deal with it with partner agencies, whether that be housing officer, whether that be social work, whether it be fire and rescue, you deal with partner agencies, okay? That's why I've written this one like that. Uh, it then goes on to say, you know, worked in various teams. Again, that's teamwork when they're policing the skills. And the development journey through education and work experience has provided a skill set that is, hey, is transferable to the role of as a police officer. Wow, that sounds good. And listen, I'm confident in my ability and feel ready for the future as a police officer. So I'm going to pat myself on the back because I think I answered that question pretty damn good, okay? Take the time, go back, read that one. You'll see there's key segments here which an assessor could look at and go, bang, that person would be a good cop. Bang, that person would be a good cop. Bang, that person would be a good cop. Or certainly be able to go through training. <laughs> Whether they're a good cop or not, you'll find out in a couple of years. But I've written that one specifically to get all the accessible criteria for that question. So take your time, read question three, because it's a banging answer. My coffee's kicking in. I'm getting quite hyper here. Question number four. Moving on. A police officer requires to be physically and mentally in good health. Please describe what you do to maintain a good level of general fitness and health. Now, I think this is quite a new thing because certainly when I went through, there was no discussion of your mental health. And everybody's ability to maintain good mental health in the workplace and in your personal life, people are understanding that this is this is actually quite a foundational requirement to be just overall competent and uh, capable at work, and that the your provider your your work provider should ensure that you're maintaining that. Okay. So, like I said, it's a new style of question. Usually, previously they would just talk about your physical fitness. You know, you need to be physically fit to be a cop. Well, actually. That's just, that's half of it. What's up there, I'm pointing to my head, you need to be as healthy up there as you are in the muscles. Now, the fitness standards in the past couple of years has dropped dramatically from, I think, 
when I went through, I was under 30, so I was having to do maybe 9.10 on the bleep test, which is, that's pretty competitive, that's pretty pretty high up there, 9.10. I think, of memory, I can't, I don't see it in front of me, it's 5.2 or 5.4, don't quote me on that. And the level of fitness that you do at Tilly Allen has dropped quite a bit, I believe, because the programmes went from being 60, 16 weeks to 12. So, anyway, let's stay on the application. So, what I've done is I have given you, in in the book, I've given you two different sample answers. I'm just going to read them out, okay? And I'm not going to interrupt myself as I read them out. I've written them from two different point of views, not from my own personal background. It's just from two different examples. So, depending on, you know, what your situation is, these might help you in writing them. Again, obviously, don't copy them. So, answer number one to the question number four. Which is question, a police officer requires to be physically and mentally in good health. Please describe what you do to maintain good level of general fitness and health. Answer. Throughout my time at school and university, I played several different sports including rugby, swimming and cross country. These sports have helped me develop in fitness and as a person. Being part of a sports team has given me a sheer understanding of working with others and helping others get the most out of their ability. This has also given me a solid level of fitness that I have continued to maintain throughout my life and something that is important to me looking forward. Having a career that is physically demanding is a real drive for me and as a police officer this would make a great fit. Throughout university I have been able to attend courses and lectures on the importance of mental health. These courses have guided me to ensure that I pay attention to my own mental health and that, my, and that of my loved ones, friends and colleagues. Maintaining an understanding of one's own mental health can ensure that we are able to perform to the best of our abilities and be cognizant when we are under stress. I look forward to maintaining my physical and mental health as a police officer. Right, bang an answer. This one's written specifically for somebody that's in uni or just out of uni. You know, if you've been there, or, you know, change university with school as well. I think it's quite challenging, Um to give good examples of mental health stuff, but I'll come on to that in a second. So from that example there, they're talking about their time playing sports, but not just about sports, talking about as working as part of a team. Again, one of the policing skills, make sure you refer to them throughout your application. We've talked about how that individual is obviously doing some sort of coaching or mentoring because they're bringing on other people to get the most out of their ability. Solid level of fitness and it's something that they've got as a baseline and they're maintaining and they're going to maintain moving forward. That's what people want to hear about police officers. Also dropped in there that they've been able to go to, like, they've went to some seminars or webinars or, you know, some courses on mental health. Sometimes it's difficult to think about what have I done about mental health. If you've went to a webinar, you've read a book, you've done something, then you're actively doing something. So really talk about it. This person is then, and I say this person, it's me pretending to be somebody, has then said that from that they've got a good understanding of their own mental health and of other people's mental health and how maybe they interact with other people. And key again at the end, I look forward to maintaining my physical and mental health as a police officer. Just a line, just to say, look, I'm aware of it and I'm going to maintain it moving forward. That's what they want to see. So again, you'll see from there, really, see if you step back. What did I say before? I said, make sure that when you do your application, this is your time to shine. This individual here, what have they done? They've played in a couple of sports teams and they've went to to, um, a course on mental health. That's all they've done. But really, you can then take that and say, well, you know, I, I played in sports teams. So what does that mean? Well, it means I'm a fit person. I'm dedicated to fitness. I've worked as part of a team. I've drawn people on to get the ability, the best of their ability out of them. I've continued to maintain this fitness in my own time. Something I like to do. It gives me a drive. I think I'm a good candidate for being a police officer because I've got that drive. Being a police officer is physically demanding. It's something I really want to do. I've went to a course on mental health. So what? Well, actually, it's given me a great understanding of my own mental health, other people's mental health, how people might act or react and that might be drawn to bad periods of mental health. And I'm going to maintain this and move it forward. And it's, it's brought on my knowledge of mental health. There's so much you could write about if you just step back and think, how am I going to make this shine? Okay. Same question, question four. And here's another example of a different person at a different stage in their life. 
Answer. Being a mother of three children and employed full-time is demanding on my time and energy levels. I was able to identify that my physical fitness levels had lowered below its previous level due to the lack of attention I'd given it. With suitable, smart goals and dedication, I've been able to show vast improvements and exceed my previous ability. I managed this all whilst maintaining my home life and work commitments. This was not easy, but with focus and my time management skills, I was able to achieve it. I have always been aware of the need for people to stay connected to their mental health and to spot signs when they need help. I see physical and mental health quite closely linked and I noticed a positive loop where my fitness levels can where my fitness levels can help my own mental health. I have a great support network through my family, friends, work colleagues and hobby classes I go to where I can speak to everyone and anyone. I find interaction with those close to you as a positive enhancer for mental health. Applying to the police later in life has given me the experience to understand my physical and mental health deeply. Right. This answer is written by a mother of three. I'm just going to say say late 30s, early 40s. And I think it's very easy for somebody in that stage of life to almost write themselves off and think to be a police officer, you need to be six foot, you need to be able to run, you know, five minute miles. That's completely incorrect. If you can, and the way I've written this is that that person has self-identified and they've been very honest, showing complete integrity, you know, saying my fitness, I identified my fitness standards were way low. And what did I do? I took suitable action. I created smart goals and I dedicated time. I actually improved and that's because I've got great uh, time management skills and dedication and focus. So you're taking a negative and you're sprinkling on absolute positivities and you're sprinkling on policing skills in your own life and you're showing it in black and white. Great answer. Pat myself on the back again. This person's then went on to... I say this person, it's obviously me that's writing it, but this individual that I'm pretending to be has then went on to talk about the interaction and the link between mental health and physical fitness or physical fitness and mental health. How it's a self-perpetuating loop. A positive loop. You improve your fitness, it actually gives you a little boost, a little bit of mental health uplift and vice versa. Okay? And then again at the end, very very straightforward uh, sentence. Just saying, applying to the police later in life, being honest, obviously, you'll see the, the age on the application, has given me the experience to understand my physical and mental health deeply. Sometimes people can think, oh, I'm older, you know, this is going to go against me in the application. Well, actually, you're older, you can draw on your experiences. You can say, look, I'm older. Applying for the police later in life has given me time to actually understand my own physical uh, capabilities and my mental health deeply. It says you've got a great understanding of both. Great answer. Two great answers there. Make sure you read them. Right, moving on to question number five. (coughs) What preparation have you undertaken before making this application to ensure that you know what to expect and to ensure that you're prepared for the role of police officer? Now this should be this should kind of be a gimme, this one. This one should be pretty straightforward because hopefully you're taking steps and measures to go about it. Now, you should really, as I've written in the book, this question's it's easy if you've done the steps because the ball's in your court. If you've been proactive and you've done stuff, then this question's dead easy to write. If you've not done anything, then you, you won't have much to write on and you need to go do something. So... I've given a list of examples of things you could do. You could visit a police station. Literally, literally just visit a police station. Go to your police community surgeries, or they might call it that terminology, something different, just your local police community meetings. You could easily, well, I say easily, if you've done a college or uni course in uniform services, or even just a small course in it. Short courses provided by college and unis. You could easily have researched a website, read a book, volunteered in your community, to get interaction with the police. And even things like maintaining your level of fitness and your mental health, those are examples as well, okay? That don't have to just be police-focused. It could be about what are you doing to maintain yourself. So let's look at an example answer. Answer is, I've ensured my preparedness covers a wide range of aspects of policing. 
In order to gain an insight into the day-to-day routine of a police officer, I proactively arranged a visit to my local police station and was able to discuss the role of the police in my community with the officers there. This also led me to attend the local community surgeries chaired by community police officers where I learned about the issues felt by the community residents and how the police are tackling them. I've also prepared myself by ensuring my fitness levels have been maintained to a high standard suitable for the demands of police duties. They're more, uh, they're more. Moreover, I prepared for, learned about and experienced the role of a police officer and the more it ins- the more I've done this, it has inspired me to enjoy to join. Sorry, stumbling on my words here. Moreover, it has prepared me, and it has also helped me learn and get experience in the role of a police officer. And the more I have done this, it has inspired me and helped me to join. So that's just a a, a quick answer there to to that question. Now that one's in your court. That ball is in your court, but you need to get out there and you need to do some proactive steps to be able to write that. Right, moving on to question number six. Policing is about ensuring the well-being and safety of the public and our communities. Please describe what you would bring to Police Scotland to enhance our ability to keep people safe. What's Police Scotland's focus? Exactly. This is a very, very, very key one. And again... You're going to want to relay fairness, integrity, respect, fairness, fairness, integrity, respect, and human rights. Sorry, I'm all over the place just now. Back into this, back in the room, back into this uh, question as well. So let's have a look at a sample answer that I've got for this one. The answer is in my current job. I do not have any line manager responsibilities, but I have influenced from peer level and provided support to colleagues during difficult experiences. I was aware a colleague was not performing as she normally does and her attitude to work had dramatically changed. But she continued to state she was fine. Being emotionally intelligent, I was aware there was a deeper reason for her current attitude and performance and in order to help her in the long term, I ultimately helped keep her safe. I elevated my concerns to the management. With her consent, I supported her and the management to get her to the help that she needed. This was my first awareness of how mental health can impact any member of society and present itself with little warning. Since then, I have developed a further understanding of mental health and emotional intelligence. This experience also taught me there are different times where making a decision to elevate a concern about a person's safety is challenging when they may not feel they need help. But using my integrity to do the right thing allowed me to confirm my decision making. I am now able to bring this knowledge and awareness to serve the public during incidents to help people keep safe. Help keep people safe. So again, this question here, you're able to relate it back to the workplace. I think a lot of people have been in this situation where either a colleague, a friend or somebody they know, they see that that person just isn't quite quite the way they normally are. And it could be that they've not slept that night, fine. But when that tends to happen over a, a sequential amount of days, or you might sort of identify a trigger that's causing that to happen frequently then you know that that person might actually be needing some help. Now, being a police officer, you're going to be out there in the community speaking to people. Not everybody's going to want your help. They're not. A lot of people are going to be turning it away, telling you to go somewhere else, maybe swearing when they're saying that. But you have to know that you still have to do certain aspects of the job. Now, in this example, the person said they were fine, this individual knew that this wasn't the case and they felt they had the morality that they had to do something. So they've went to their management, they've told them their concerns and it's not just stopped there but they've then followed that through to support the management and the individual, maybe being a link between both. And that way you can then talk about, if you've had a situation like that, you can then talk about it at the end to say, look, this has brought on my awareness, this has developed my understanding and this will help me be a good police officer. 
So let's look at another example. Answer is, as a volunteer course support worker during my university course, I was expected exposed to a wide range of issues students had. My role revolved around academic matters, but I quickly realised that it wasn't just support for studies that students needed. I knew that as an organisation, the university, we needed to support our students as best we could. And currently, there were no services that helped them with mental health. I worked with departments in the university and the external partners to arrange for services that students could use to help them during difficult periods. This exposed me to how important it is for people to receive the right support from the right people. I can bring to Police Scotland the knowledge of identifying people that need support and then finding the correct support in agency. Further, I have a, a passion for helping people and working with others to achieve this. The police do work individually, but they are part of many small teams that are in turn part of a larger organisation that helps keep people safe. And I'm eager to be part of that. So again, there's another example where the person was at university, they were assisting in a, I think it was a volunteer role I said there, where they would help people for something. In this case, it was academic studies. But they quickly identified that there was something else going on there. Not only did these people, students, need support for their academics, they also needed some sort of uh, support with either the mental health or they needed support in just other areas of life, which actually might be affecting their grades as well. From that example, I then talked about partner agencies again. This individual realised it's not just the, the university that has to deal with this stuff. They also deal with this with other agencies as well. And that the university is just part of partner agencies, which makes up a larger beast, which is the, the overall support service to people. And again, the person talked about being part of a team and how they can then bring what they did in that role to being a police officer to help keep people safe. So those are two different examples for people, for people of different stages of life for that question there. And it is really important to remember that policing is not just about jailing people. It's not arresting people. It's not catching people doing stabbings all the time. That is part of it. A lot of it is mental health related. It really, really is. It's going to incidents where people have a mental health crisis or people have concerns for people. And there might be situations where you go, somebody raises a concern, you go and speak to the individual who is the subject of the concern, and they say, I'm fine. They might be fine. You might go there, and they appear to be fine. But you might go there, they're saying they're fine, and what you're, what you're observing is not normal behaviour, or certainly not safe behaviour. And it's all about keeping them safe. You don't do that just by yourself, you do it with partner agencies. So think about this one, reflect on it, and utilise these examples to help develop your own. Question seven, last question. I hope you're still there. I hope you're still there. Question seven. Please provide any other information you wish to add to support your application. Mm. Now, this is a funny one, isn't it? Do you answer that one? Oh, yes, 100% you do. 200 words. You can't give. You can't just give 200 words away, so you definitely are going to put an answer in here. Now, there's two things you could think of. You can... You can think about stuff that you've not mentioned in your application so far. Or you can think about things that you already have mentioned that you want to reintroduce or expand on. You can think about your the police officer skills that you haven't mentioned, potentially. Experiences that you have had, whether they be work, you know, university, higher education, whether a personal experience that you've had. Or times in your life when you've really shown displayed some of the values, respect, integrity, fairness. Think about what you haven't said already that you really think is a good reason why you would be a good police officer. I've got an example here, and this one's written in a personal sense. 
Here's the answer that I would put. My career as a fire officer in the RAF has developed me both professionally and personally in ways that would bring a direct benefit to Police Scotland and the public it serves. I've worked closely with partner agencies within the emergency services, brackets, ambulance and police, but also external partners such as the local council and trading standards. I understand that in order to achieve the outcome desired, even large organisations have to work with other equally large organisations to make this happen. As the senior firefighter at a large fire station, I have led on all aspects of equality and diversity training, ensuring that mandated competencies are maintained and suitable training provided. I have completed two specialist courses, Casualty Notifying Officer and Visiting Officer, which upskilled me in dealing with death or serious injury to military personnel, whilst being able to support his or her immediate family after such an incident. The role of police officer requires officers to have emotional intelligence and interpersonal skills to deliver unwanted news to families in a professional and measured approach, a skill that I have experience of and I am constantly working on. I am now at a stage in my life where I have developed my skill set, understand my personal values and have relevant experience where I can now benefit Police Scotland as an organisation and contribute to keeping people safe. That is 30 words over. However, <laughs> pat myself on the back because that, that sounds pretty good. Why does that sound good? Well, let's break it down. One, I've not been shy. I have laid it out there. I have said, look, my this is almost going back to question three and question one, which is your personal statement and your, and your development journey. But in my application, for example, I've not been able to talk about these things, so I've brought them out. I am saying in no uncertain terms, what I've done so far has really developed me and I'm now, I am now a great candidate. Not just a good candidate, I am a great candidate for police officer. I've talked about how I've worked with partner agencies. I've talked about how I have key responsibility for equality and diversity training and how I've made sure that these are uh, is a suitable training provided for the personnel that I was responsible for. I've talked about as I said, the partner agencies and how I fit in as a small cog into a large machine to make sure that the organisations are functioning properly. I said specifically, I would bring a direct benefit to Police Scotland and the public it serves. I've not been shy about it. I've talked about courses that I've done that are similar to what Police Scotland might have to do in providing death messages to families. I've shown that I'm, I've been quite humble saying that I'm still working on it. said that this is a similar type skill which I have developed and still work on because I always want to see your continuous work. I've explained specifically that at my stage of life, I have developed my skill set, I know my values, and I've got relevant experience that can help Police Scotland in its, its own mission, its own vision, and it can help Police Scotland do what it needs to do, which is keep people safe. So that's kind of tied that question off in a nice little bow. It's talked about me, it's talked about things I've done, but it's also related it back to the values, to the mission, to making sure that what I've done reflects what Police Scotland does as well. So... Do you answer question seven? Absolutely, you answer question seven. It's up to you what you put in it, obviously. But I would make sure that this one just ties your application off in a nice bow at the end. You've not talked about things that are notable, noteworthy. Make sure you talk about them, but also relate them back to the Police Scotland values, okay? A couple of key points that we'll just go through. Obviously it goes without saying Don't lie in your application Integrity is absolutely everything It really really is You can't lie about this You can't just think that If you do the application Then you're on to the next thing Because this might come out In either the assessment centre Where the exercise is Or during your interview So make sure you don't lie in it Also make sure you have to be laser focused on your word count if you go over it then it's not got good attention to detail 
attention to detail is very, very important as a police officer. If you start off with a, a word count of 220 and it should be 200 or no more than 200, then it's not going to be good for you. Like I said, don't be shy or embarrassed about selling yourself. This is your time to shine. It really, really is. Think about using I, not we. The assessor wants to really know what you've done. What was your contribution? Talk about it from your terms. If it's a group thing, then yeah, definitely talk about it as a group. But talk about what you've done, because they want to know what you've done, not what other people have done. It says really read the question, but hopefully you've went, you've listened to this and you've read the book and you've got a good understanding of the questions, but really reflect on them. It's really important. As I've said there, at all times when writing your answer, just, just think Police Scotland values, show them in your answer and how you align to them, how you display them. Police officer qualities, literally use them in your example. This situation developed my, boom, Police Scotland skill. Serving the public and communities, the job is all about these things. It's about serving the public. That is the customer. The public is the customer. And the communities is the area in what you're doing it, the wider collective. Make sure you get that in there if you can. How you did it. How you achieved it. Similar to the interview and the assessor wants to know how you did things, not just what. So not just, I did, I was this, I did that. Like, how did you do it? Talk about it. It's hard. It's really hard because you've only got a couple of hundred words to write about it, but really go for it. And the personal statement is all about you. Make it personal, but maintain the formal approach. Tell them your aspirations, your motivations for the job and your desire. Make sure it's serve the public, communities, keep you safe. Get them in there and it will really, really help your application. That's everything for the application. Hopefully, hopefully you're still with me. That was a heavy one. I felt that one. Once you've got your application, make sure you give it to somebody else to look at. Sanity check. If they come up, if they, if they come back with loads of corrections, loads of things you need to change, it's a hard one because they might not be right. So maybe get two people to read it. And if there's loads, if both people say you've got to make a lot of changes, then maybe maybe you action that. But if one person says, I would write it like this, well, maybe you just stick to your guns. Get somebody to read it, though, to, to get a sanity check over it. Um, and make it personal. Right, I'll see you in the next webinar, webinar five, webinar number five, which is the PSET. Welcome to webinar number five. This is all about the PSET, the Police Scotland Entry Exam. Correction, <laughs> Police Scotland Entry Test. Wow, it's been a long day. So, this webinar is going to be pretty short, but there will be some information in here. It's definitely worth listening to. The majority of your time for the PSET needs to be practicing it. But I will give you some, not inside information, just information that is obvious to me having done the test. It's nothing about the actual questions you're going to get asked, but it's all about how you, as an individual, should set yourself up for success by just getting the, the basic information of the piece set okay so what is the piece set and i'm just going to call it the piece set from now on okay not the police scotland entry test but it's an examination that tests three different areas numeracy literacy and information handling now information handling and numeracy is similar and we'll go into that in a sec in a second Broad information, there's 49 questions. I don't know why it's 49. That must be for a reason. I don't know why it's 49. It's a bit of a strange number to me. 49 questions, you've got 60 minutes, which sounds like a really long time, an hour to do this exam. To be fair, when I did it, probably finished it in 40 minutes because you do get into the hang of just getting through the questions. But it works out at about an, you know, a minute, just say a minute per question approximately. A minute, 10 seconds, maybe, something like that. Some of the questions are actually quite big, but some of the questions will have maybe four questions in the single question. So you might have to just read some a paragraph, for example, if it's literacy, but you'll have three questions or four questions in that single one. 
So although you're taking in a lot of information, you're actually answering four questions. So you probably have about four minutes for that overall bit, if that makes sense. Information for you, you need to be able to score across all three areas. So you can't just be great at literacy and information handling, like ace it, get every single question right, and bomb on the numeracy. You have to be average across all three, okay? That is actually quite important because if you do the tests, the, you know, the practice ones, and you know you're bad at literacy, then you need to double down and really make sure that you're getting to at least an acceptable level of standard for that one because it has to average out across all three. Things for you to know in, in this one. Take your time. Obviously, everybody's going to say that, but take your time and just read the question. I've seen a lot of people do this that have you know, had degrees and they've struggled because they've lit the overall stress levels, to be fair, off the exam, get to them. They've let their emotions get the best of them. They've not just taken the time to sit back and think this is this is kind of a basic level exam. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be relaxed and I'm gonna go into it and give it my best. If you do that, that you will start to shine to your the best of your ability because you've taken the stress away. So practically, let's give you some practical information. Let's start off with the numeracy. Numeracy, a lot of the questions really just comes down to basic levels of knowledge for for numbers. Oh, you know, basic sums. I say basic, it's not basic to everybody, but they are basic level. The fact is you've just got to do quite a few of them in quite a short period of time. Practice doing your calculations, make sure you know all them, that's fine. But when it comes to numeracy as well, you might have to look at different different types of calculations. And these might throw you. The biggest thing for numeracy is just to double check them if you can, if you've got the time. Because there's nothing worse than forgetting to carry a one or just not seeing a takeaway or something like that. And you've got 24 and the answer is 25 and you've just missed it by one. But that's a wrong answer. So numeracy is at a basic level. The best kind of information I can give you for that is to double check your double check your answer at the end if you can. Now some of it will be given to you straight up. You know, just say an example of 75 add 152. Something like that. But it might be broken down into a different way. It might be, you know, there are 16, uh, 16 house burglaries, obviously not burglary in Scotland, house break-ins over the course of seven days. What is that split down into per day? Obviously, 16 divided by 7 is not a good example. Say so there's 21 house breakings in seven days. What is that per day? So that's that's very basic levels of maths. But it's in a way that challenges you a little bit. So be prepared for the numeracy to be both straight up, 7 add 2 sort of thing, or it might be broken down with a little bit of wording. So just be prepared for that one. Information handling. This throws people, to be fair, because other than at school... You tend not to get these types of information handling exam questions because in your day to day work, you're handling a lots of information, a lot of information, but you're handling it in a way where you're not essentially being assessed or you're not being tested. For information handling, just get familiar if you've forgotten what a graph looks like, whether it be a line graph, a bar chart, a pie chart. Just get your eye and your head into the position again of being able to understand these different types of graphs and then being able to ask, answer or be prepared to answer some of the analytical questions. So it's just having a look at bar graphs. The question might be, again, how many assaults have happened over a month and you've got the bar graph there. But there'll be two different variables, so they might say, on the bar graph, it's one against a 40 to 60 year old, and then 
the other bar, bar graph might say from a zero to 40 year old and you've got to add it up and that might be in, in the question hopefully <laughs> me rambling on there hasn't thrown you information handling it is actually quite straightforward but if you're stressed out you're going to you're just going to get yourself muddled up so be relaxed but do a little bit of homework do some practice tests if you've got them so you can go back to the information handling bit I've actually got a YouTube video on on the YouTube channel which shows you how I actually go through the information handling stuff and the whole piece set in, in its in entirety. It's easy for me to do it because it's a question obviously that I know the answer to but I show you how I go through actually assessing the question and gathering the information. So that might be very helpful because picture paints a thousand words. Now the best bit of information I can give you on the P set is probably when it comes to the literacy. Now, I put my hand up, I am terrible at spelling. I really, really am. For some reason, you know, I'm in my thirties and I've still just not been very good at spelling. I don't know why. It doesn't come naturally to me, but I've not I've not developed it to a very, very high standard. Now you might get some questions on spelling. So if spelling's not your forte, then you need to you need to kind of you need to get better at it. But some of the the literacy or language style questions might require you to. It's also a little bit of information handling because you're you're taking in quite a lot of information, but they might provide you a big paragraph or three paragraphs or four paragraphs of of information. 95% of that is waffle <laughs> and they'll ask you a question based on a couple of different aspects of that big sort of couple of paragraphs. And what that's testing you is it's testing you to actually do a bit of information handling but from a, a literacy point of view where you've got to comb through these paragraphs to find the answer to the question. And that shows your ability to be able to be analytical and take the information and find the answer because it's in there. It shows that you're able to digest it and actually find the answer and answer it in the correct way. And then again in my YouTube video I've also got a, a way that I actually comb through it. The way I do it is I'll, and this is all up to you, it depends on how you want to do it, but the way I've found laterally to be quite a good way to do that is if you read it all in a one hour, there's so much information in these paragraphs that it'll follow you. Go in one ear and it'll come out the other. Whereas if you go to the question, you find out what the question is. Say the question is for the example, which you've got on the YouTube channel. It's about, uh, it's all about Police Scotland. It's about area control rooms. How many locations are there? I would just comb through the paragraphs to find out when it starts talking about area control rooms. Ah. Paragraph three, perfect. Come down to the question again. What's the actual question? Something about six locations. Find it there. No, it says four locations. Bang, that's, that's incorrect. That's me going through this really, really quickly because I've done that question a couple of times. But the best way is to just develop your own way to get through the literacy thing. So again, just covering that P set, 49 questions, got an hour to do it, approximately one question per minute. You need to be averaging out across the three areas of numeracy, literacy and information handling. And this is essentially the minimum level of standard of education that you'll require to be successful through Tully Allen and then into your probation as well. I've got a self-reflection exercise Exercise number six, it's pretty straightforward. It's asking you about your confidence across those three areas. It's a very good one because there's a lot of great police officer candidates out there that don't pass this test. And they don't pass it because they've either not given it enough attention, they've either kind of been lacking that self-reflection, or they've either known that they're not very good in something and just hoped they'd cuff it. I personally know a couple of people that have failed this that have actually got a good level of education but they've just not really given it the, the due consideration that they need to pass this test. 
I know somebody that's passed it, sorry, has failed it twice and is going to go for a third attempt, I think. So make sure you do your practice, make sure you go through the self-reflection exercise, really ask yourself, is there something that you need to double down on here? And then just do the work. And that's everything for this webinar, short and quick. There's more information on the YouTube channel if you want to watch me go through a couple of P-set questions and how I comb through the information. But it's really just doing time and time again, getting those three areas up to a good standard. Okay, I'll catch you in Assessment Centre, which is webinar number seven, and we'll give you some general info. Okay, all aboard for webinar number six. This is where we start to really get into the information that is going to be beneficial for you when you come to, bang, the Assessment Centre. Now, I've split this one down into a couple of different webinars because we need to talk about the Assessment Centre in general. We need to talk about the assessment centre exercises and then we need to do separate webinars on the interview. So, this webinar, webinar number six, is just going to paint the picture for you of general information about the assessment centre basics. We'll then go into more detail. So this one you might not listen to a few times, the other ones you might listen to a couple of times. So, general info for the assessment centre what is the assessment centre? Hopefully you know what it is by now. But the assessment centre is, a, is essentially a time for you to show up face to face, see the police staff and for them to see you, okay? They'll be assessing you from the minute you step in there. So first impressions count and continuous all day impressions count. Impressions count from the first minute you enter there when you're having your lunch, during the interview, during the assessments, and when you're leaving. Do not forget that, okay, because they'll be watching you the whole time. So what is the assessment centre? Well, previously, you would have two interviews. You'd have one before this, but now this is the first time, potentially, that the assessment staff are going to have seen you. Now, some of them might have seen you during the PSET. They might have seen you, I don't know, maybe during the medical, if they were there, but this is the, the main time. The, the staff might be different on previous times, but this is the time when they're going to be assessing you. You're going to be assessed on assessment group exercises, and you're going to be assessed in an interview with two people, which we'll talk about. One big thing I want to cover here is dress, and this general information is dress. And I've written that there. Dress smart, business dress, or equivalent. It is better to be too smart than less. So basics for for a bloke would be uh, shirt and tie, suit jacket. And, well, suit, should I say. Shirt and tie. Nice shoes. The female equivalent, I don't really know. It could be exact same. It could be uh, shirt tie, suit jacket. Or it could be skirt, smart dress. I don't know too much information on female dress, if I'm honest. Um... But just use your your uh, your discretion there on that one. For me, if you have a bit of style, this is a time, yeah, you could show a bit of style. If you've got a little bit of style in how you dress, absolutely show it. But no Star Wars ties, no Marvel ties. This is still a formal day. If you've got nice shoes, you know, you could wear the nice shoes. If you've got nice socks, yeah, sure. Sure, why not? But make sure they're formal. If you've got a nice suit that's, you know, for for blokes, if it's quite uh, like a light blue, mm, that's maybe better for a wedding. This is a formal day and you want to show yourself in a professional context. So yeah, feel free to show a bit of style, but you only get once one time to make a first impression. Um, and it's a formal day, so make sure you do that. So we've covered the basics there for dress, which is very, very important. Like I said, the assessment centre is their time to assess you. It's going to be split into assessment exercises and an interview, which we'll cover in separate webinars, but we'll just cover very basically now. The interview will be a two-on-one interview, potentially a three-on-one if somebody else is there to be assessed as well. And that's the assessors being assessed, not you. 
Usually, usual structure, it'll be a sergeant or a PC and a sergeant or a sergeant and an inspector or a PC and an inspector and potentially a civilian police staff member if they're assessing the police staff, if that makes sense. They'll do an interview, they'll cover all the interview questions which we'll discuss and they'll split up halfway. First half, one will write, one will answer. Halfway they'll switch over and then they'll do the same thing in reverse. The group exercises, there are a myriad of different types of exercises which we'll discuss and we'll talk about. But understand that you'll be doing group exercises as a collective, both from a sitting position, so like a tabletop position, or practically as well. So this is a big one. This is your one big day uh, to really, really shine and, and show your qualities as a potential police officer. We've covered the basics there in the assessment center. And in the next webinar, webinar seven, we'll actually discuss the assessments. So webinar seven is one that you might listen to a couple of times, certainly go backwards and forward with uh, the webinar and the book. But this is just the general information. So I'll see you in the next webinar. Okay, welcome to webinar number seven. And this is all about the assessment center and specifically about the assessments that you can expect. Now, there's no guarantee in what I'm going to discuss here. This is purely based on my experiences. You might experience something different. The assessments might change. <coughs> and it's important that you understand that what I'm telling you just now isn't insider information. It's just general information that you might or could reasonably expect. Now, when it comes to the assessments, you can reasonably expect maybe two or three group exercises, and one competency-based interview, which we'll discuss later on. Now, the group exercises, they really do range in versatility of what you could expect. You could reasonably expect group discussions, problem-solving exercises, decision-making exercises, team-meeting exercises, or practical-type group exercises, or an icebreaker, which we'll discuss first in a second. But what's the purpose of these group exercises and what, what are you supposed to or meant to try and display throughout the process? Well, the whole idea of the group exercise is to put you in situations, scenarios, which they're not similar to what you'd expect as a police officer, but the, the core principles of what you need to be able to show are the same. You're put in positions where you need to be able to interact with others. You need to be able to show that you can deal with conflict, whether you can come up with good ideas, whether you can be obstructive in places that you shouldn't be, how well you work as part of a team, how you are emotionally intelligent, the dynamics between you and other people. It's putting you in positions of low levels of stress, but it's showing it's put you in a position to show what it could be like as a police officer in higher levels of stress, but also for the assessors to assess you in these periods of stress and to assess your contribution to the overall team and the objective. Now, we've discussed to a degree the CVFs. This is what you have to show during the interview. It's a competency-based interview at the end of the day. And when you're doing the assessment centre, you also need to be cognizant that you should be showing the CVFs. And the CVFs, the competencies, you need to show that you're emotionally aware, that you're taking ownership, that you work collaboratively, that you deliver support and inspire, that you analyse critically, and that you're innovative and open-minded. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about remembering these phrases word by word. Because it's quite a complicated little phrase, each one. You need to show that you're emotionally aware, that you're taking your ownership, you work together. You deliver support and inspire, analyse critically, and you're innovative and open-minded. These are difficult to remember. But you should remember that you need to work as part of a team. You need to be shown all the policing skills. And this is what they're going to assess when it comes to the assessments. So, 
what should you expect for the assessments? Well, you should expect that you're going to get put in a situation that you possibly have never been in before. Each one is different, so it's hard for me to tell you what to expect. But we're going to go through the different examples of the different types of exercises that you can expect so that I can manage your expectations with what might actually come up for you. So it could be reasonable for you to expect some form of icebreaker. Now you won't always get this, but it's a potential that you might get one of these. Now the icebreaker has got a couple of different functions. It's there to, firstly, for them to get to know you a bit, the assessors, and the rest of your team to get to know you as well. This is actually a fantastic opportunity for you to do two things. One, let them know you, tell them about you, let them start to see the policing qualities and the police skills that you show, the values that you have. If the values are similar to Police Scotland, hint, hint, wink, wink, yeah, they want to be. But it also gives you the opportunity to be able to just relax into the day. There's nothing worse than missing a missed opportunity that would have really helped you set up for success for the whole day. So the icebreaker, it is quite important to be able to do a good job on this one for you. More for you. This won't hold as much weight, in my opinion as other group exercises or the interview, but it really helps you relax into the day. So the icebreaker could be between five and 10 minutes. It's essentially a one-way briefing of you telling them, the assessors and other people about you. You relax once you've done, but it's your time to shine. It really is. And you want to make sure that even though you're just talking about you, that you're still showing these values up in your day-to-day life and your development journey as well. So how would I structure this first and foremost? Well, you can start from where you're from, a bit of info, you know, if you're from a notable area, I don't know, Edinburgh, that's a bad example. Dundee is where I'm from. It's known for jute jam and journalism, the home of the dandy the beano. So you, people that aren't from there might not know that. So you can just drop something in like that. You can then just start to talk about your education, your schooling, any further education you've done, moving on naturally to your work history, maybe your first job or your part-time job when you're at school, whatever, and move on from there, just step it through. If you've got loads of different jobs, you might want to just hone into the, the ones that you either really liked or they were noteworthy or they're the most similar to the policing skills that you need to show. You can talk about your hobbies, talk about your interests, Try to thread throughout it the the desire to join the police. You know, if you had an early spark in joining the police, but it didn't happen back then, maybe talk about that. And then what's ultimately got you to here, to be stood in front of everybody doing your icebreaker, and link it back to the Police Scotland values. And it doesn't have to be completely succinct and a, a beautiful bit of uh, presentation work. Just be honest with it. And just make sure that you're showing the integrity fairness and respect throughout of it so a lot of people get hung up on the icebreaker Uh, they really really do because they just don't it's a difficult one you don't want to stand there and and sound like a salesman salesperson but at the same time you really really want to make sure that you're putting yourself out there showing all your qualities, talking about yourself, but talking about yourself in in a good light, okay? My advice would be keep it straightforward, you know, talk, start from the start and work your way forward. Um, making sure that the icebreaker is talking about the values. Now, you don't have to say, you know, I worked at a construction business and I showed respect and integrity and some human rights, and fairness, and moving on. That doesn't sound very natural. That's not actually, it doesn't sound very good. But if you talked about, I worked at a construction uh, factory, and we had a mix uh, workforce of different types of backgrounds, different types of nationalities, 
And it really opened my eyes to working with people from different nationalities and making sure that everybody there was treated with the same level of respect regardless of where they're from or their, their beliefs or anything like that. So that's just a natural one. That's just how it could naturally come up. And I guarantee you, if you sit and reflect on your own journey and your own icebreaker, then you will find areas that you were actually shown those values. You just maybe don't realise it. Now again, it's a good chance if you're if you're a funny person, you could drop something funny in there. I would err on the side of caution with funny, because it is a formal day. Absolutely, don't swear. And watch your 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 type of language. Make sure it is still still a formal day. And you're you're being assessed. You might think it's a funny icebreaker, but you are still absolutely one hundred percent being assessed. But at the same time. A little bit of humour in there would probably be appreciated by everybody because it's a stressful environment. And it's reasonable to expect as well that the icebreaker might be delivered in a different way. So the icebreaker might not necessarily just be tell us about yourself. The icebreaker might be pitched to you in a certain way. Tell us about your development journey to get you to be stood here today could be that it could be tell us about the reasons from your work experience why you have wanted to join the police it could be tell us why you want to join the police it could be tell us about yourself it it could be pitched to you in many different ways okay so you have to be wary not to have something written down completely and memorized about your development journey and then they ask you a question of why do you want to join the police and it's completely different and you've just completely missed the question okay so i would go in there with a good understanding of who i am and what i've done and why i want to join the police and a couple of values that have shown up throughout my journey whether it be from school, work, hobbies, sport, whatever. Have that in your head. You can either have cue cards as well. If you if you want to, if you're going to forget that, which is easy to do. And just enjoy it. Easy for me to say, hard to do, but just try and enjoy it. So, I've got an example here and I'll read it out pretending to be a person called David Smith. Here's a a short icebreaker. Morning everyone, my name is David Smith and I'm 26 years old. I currently stay in Edinburgh but I originally come from Inverness. I was born in Inverness where I went to school and then this is also where all my family, close family and friends are from. I went to Inverness High School which was a relatively good school but I didn't achieve the grades that I really felt like I, I should have looking back now. I was able to finish with a few qualifications which I was proud of but with retrospect I feel I could have really achieved a lot more and I'm sure a lot of people feel like that when they when they leave school. After high school I went straight into the world of work where I started off uh, with a few temporary jobs which happens. It really just got going from job to job when a, a vacancy came up. I managed to finally get a contract job with a HR company and this allowed me to move to Edinburgh and stay with the same company which was really good because I wanted to stay with them. I started off as an admin assistant and progressed to working in the department that helps people apply for their housing allocation correctly, like in a correct manner. This, I'll be honest, this really opened my eyes to how there are vulnerable members of society all throughout Scotland. Seeing this firsthand. And the additional needs that people needed really surprised me. I actually, I really did enjoy that job and I got a lot of satisfaction with dealing with customers that were most in need of my assistance. But I feel like I've got a bit more to give to society and I want to maintain that level of service and help to vulnerable people. And this is what's drawn me to working with communities all around me. For me... You know, working as a police officer has always appealed to me and I thought I wouldn't be suitable, um, a suitable fit due to my lack of qualifications. Like I, like I said, I left school without any really good qualifications. 
It wasn't until I started playing in a local football team that as a few uh, police officers that I learned about the job a little bit more and realised that it's open to people just like me. I managed to organise a visit to the police station and speak to officers there and once I did that I knew that they were kind of similar to me and they had a similar level, similar level of education. And since then, I've just really I've I've done everything I can to research being a police officer. This is what's led me to being stood here today, giving this short brief. Uh, and that's pretty much everything. You know, an interesting fact about me is I recently ran a half marathon, or I kind of ran it or walked it, but I completed it. So that's just a kind of informal little, you know, way I'd give a, an icebreaker there. With a, a little bit of humour at the end. I forgot to mention the question there would be, tell us about yourself and your journey to join the police and then just an interesting fact. So there's just a, 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 a decent little one there for you. But it's all got to be personal to you, your actual your journey and an interesting fact at the end as well, if that's what they ask for. <laughs> so... That's the icebreaker, that's the shortest one. Now, the, like I said, there are other assessments out there. There's a group discussion, there's a problem-solving type one, a decision-making one, and a team meeting type exercise, and then your practical ones. So let's go through a couple of the different ones. Now, I'm just going to lump in the problem-solving and the decision-making as a, a similar type of exercise, okay? Because they are quite similar. What you might have is you might have um, a briefing sheet provided to you. You'll go in a room potentially, sit down, everybody around the table. You'll get a briefing sheet that gives you all the information off the exercise. Usually between 20 and 30 minutes. And sorry, up to 45 minutes for the exercise. Now that might be split into 10 minutes of reading the brief, 10 minutes of discussion, and then the rest of it, action. This is very dependent on the type of exercise, so I'm not, I can't go into too much detail. But what you can reasonably expect from a problem-solving or a decision-making exercise is that there's an ethical dilemma. It's not very clear-cut, though you'll get a, a whole briefing on what's going on, and you've got to solve a problem or make a decision. And it's just not straightforward. As in, there's no real right answer. Okay? So what you need to make sure that is you're not overthinking that there has to be the right answer. It's all about how you get there to that decision or how you solve that problem. And you need to be able to provide a sound rationale towards your decision making. And again, coming back to those uh, core competencies that you're going to be assessed against when you're going through this. It's how are you emotionally aware how do you take ownership? How do you work collaboratively, deliver support and inspire, analyse critically and making sure that you're innovative and open-minded? So like I said, you'll have a, a briefing sheet provided to you. You might then have a period of time where you discuss it as a team and then ultimately come up with your decision. Now this is when you've got to make sure, because it gets people can get very, very heated, need to be sure that you are coming across in a good manner. Remember, what are the assessors looking at? They're looking at you and how you interact with other people in the group. How you deal with conflict. How well you work with other people. How you respond to the opinion of other people. So when it comes to an ethical dilemma... This is your ethics at heart. You, you will have a a decision that you think is the correct answer and somebody might have a different decision. It's all about how you interact with that person or the other people and their decision. You don't shut it down. You don't speak louder. You don't certainly don't swear, but you don't start to show facial signs of just disagreement. It all needs to be done in a polite manner. So if you go to the book, I've given you a specific example. This is really good in my opinion. I've made it up completely. But this is an ethical dilemma. So if you look at the book, page... What page is it? It might be 100 and, 110 or there, thereabouts. 
This gives you an ethical dilemma where there's been a car crash, a multiple car crash, and there's a, a, a multitude of casualties, and you're having to extract them in order. Now, each person, like there's a Miss Bo Peep, there's an Iron Man, a Miss Daisy, a Thor. There's a little bit of narrative on their current status, their age, how injured they are, where they are, and how long it's going to take to extract them. Now, you need to then look at the brief, think what's happened. Your your objective is to extract them uh, within a time period of an hour. And each one has a different time period of how long it's going to take to extract. And you need to come up with a batting order, a list of one to six on who you think should be extracted. Now, that's an ethical dilemma. You want to save them all, right? But you can't. You have to make a list and go through them one to six. <laughs> Now, in a situation like this, for the assessment centre, people will get very animated, they'll get very opinionated, and a lot of people won't want to deviate from their opinion. So it's all about how you communicate your opinion, how you listen to their opinion, how you then think, well, I'm going to try and influence this person because they want number three when I want number two. So I'm going to put across my reason, my rationale, I'm going to explain myself, I'm going to explain my decision making and I'm going to do it in a polite and respective way, okay? That is absolutely key. They will, the assessors will spot bad um, communication skills, bad team working skills, interpersonal skills a mile off. So if you're the type of person whose face paints a picture when they're speaking, I would suggest you need to to need to work on that it's a very hard thing to work on because you might not even know you're doing it but that is something that they'll pick up on the assessments so that's the problem solving and decision making style exercise now the brief will change okay you know obviously i've made that one up completely the thing will change the format's normally the same you'll have a briefing you'll have maybe information sheet time period to digest it time period to to discuss the best thing is to just put your opinion out there but be able to back it up and explain it and listen if somebody comes up with a better example a better rationale and you think it is better then hands are up and say listen i think that's a great example that's a great uh, listing for example and go with it so that's that one and again look at the book because i've given you a, a full list of the order i would for example do that one and a rationale as to why and I would stand by that. Somebody wants to change my mind and happy, I'll, I'll have my mind changed. If not, then I'm going to still put forward my uh, my rationale. So another one you could expect is a group discussion. Now, again, this is where the CVF core competencies and the things that you're being assessed against are so, so important. Because the group discussion, you'll be sat in a room, a classroom, sat at some tables, around a table. <coughs> and you'll have different topical topics thrown in there one by one. So this will take between 20, 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. And they can maybe introduce six different subjects for you to discuss. And they'll throw it out there, such as... Is 18 too young to join Police Scotland? Discuss. And the assessor, who won't speak to you during it, other than asking that question, will just throw that out there and just wait for somebody to say the first word. Now, you can look at it different ways. Do you want to be the first person to speak? Maybe. Do you want to let somebody else speak? Yeah, fine. The silence will be so difficult. If you've never done a group discussion style thing before, it's very... It's strange because it's very formal and everybody wants to be respective or hopefully everybody wants to be respective. But other people have their own, their own opinion. And if you've got an opinion on that one, put it forward, but make sure you can always back it up. Don't just think, yeah, it is too young. So here's an example. Is 18 too young to join the police um, in Police Scotland? And if somebody just goes, yeah, 18 is too young because I just don't think they're very good. That's a terrible answer. You need to provide a sound rationale as to why you decide that or why you think that. And if you can bring it in through the values, oh, even better. 
So an example could, could be, this is off the top of my head, is 18 too young to join Police Scotland? I might go, I think 18 is a suitable age for Police Scotland to set their lowest level of requirements to enter a police, but I think it's very important to remember that everybody, not everybody at 18 is the same. So a lot of people mature at different ages, a lot of people mature through later in life. But it is also important to remember that 18 year olds could have had significant life experiences at that age. They might have had multiple jobs at that age, they might be living by themselves, they might be in higher education or, or completed higher education. They could be parents at that age that might have even served in the military for a year and then left and then wanted to join the police Scotland. So I think it's really important to understand that 18-year-olds can bring a lot of experience to police and they also bring it bring with them a different mindset, a different generational mindset, different ways of doing things, different understandings of how things can be done and also be able to look at things from a technology basis. Sometimes the, the smartest people at understanding how technology can be used are sometimes the youngest people, the youngest demographic. So I, I like to think that 18 is a good age or a fine age for people to join, but it's a good understanding that not everybody at 18 has matured enough to be a police officer. That's, I've just made that up off the top of my head. But I've tried to be respectful to, to people that are 18. I've tried to be balanced in my approach, but still put across my opinion, which I think it is fine, but not for ev- not for every eighteen year old. And I've kind of, I think I try to come across with some of the values and and some of the policing skills as well. So if you could do that, amazing. Things to avoid is cutting people off, speaking over people, completely pointing at people, using your hand, saying I don't think you were right. Don't call somebody you. Try and use their name. And just make sure that you give a good rationale as to your opinion. Now, the group discussion, like I said, maybe 30, 40 minutes. Uh, the the people, the assessors might push you along if you're, talk- if you're all talking too much. Something, if you can do, which would be amazing, if there's somebody in the corner that just isn't saying anything... It's difficult to do, but if you can introduce them into the conversation, it will benefit them so much and it shows your kind of coaching and mentoring skills as well. Just think about yourself, but also think about others as well if you can throughout the group discussion. Now, you can have a team meeting style exercise. And this one, this could be introduced where you get a brief and you're either elected to be a position with it, you might be the team leader, you might be the person that takes the minutes, or you might self-nominate for that one. Completely different, they change all the time. Same thing, you know, ultimately it's the same. The, the fundamentals are the same. You are given an objective, which will be to resolve an issue with the team, or to do something and then provide a briefing thereafter. And like I said, you'll either be set, a position or you'll self-elect to be a position but you'll have a task to do and either discuss it in the meeting and get an objective at the end again similar to the group discussion but a bit more structured because you know what you have to do specifically all the principles are the same be considerate of others don't speak over them don't be condescending try and not have a snidey face if you've got a snidey face provide a rationale as to what you're saying or why you're deciding something if somebody proves you to be wrong have the decency to say actually I, I see it from your point of view now yeah I think yeah I think that is the right answer that doesn't show you in a bad light if anything that shows you in an even better light because you don't double down on a decision that you've made which in the light of other information appears to be the wrong decision you could step up and say, listen, yeah, I agree with you there. That's very strong. That's a very strong person that does that. The team meeting one could be very different, so we can't go into too much information there. Again, just remember it's formal. The team meeting, there's potential for it to kind of unravel a bit because if you've never chaired a, a meeting before, I do it a lot, it's quite a difficult thing to do. People can start talking in the corner, 
people can come off topic and you've still got an objective to achieve and there's a it's difficult for you to maintain order of people carrying out these different functions in a team meeting but just give it your best give it a go certainly don't raise your voice because I, I have heard of people raising voices in, in meetings and it, it's not good and it's especially not good when you're in an assessment centre but if you can observe anybody doing team meetings in your workplace it will really really benefit you to just see how team meetings should go maybe your workplace they don't go very well but that's how they should go um, and just get a little understanding of how the team meetings are carried out now, the last style of exercise are practical group exercises. Now, the other ones we've di- discussed are the problem-solving, decision-making, team meeting. They've all kind of been sat down with a briefing sheet using your voice to uh, essentially do the, the exercise. Practical ones could be, again, I'll give you a couple of random examples which you can access on the open internet to see. They could be using big Lego it could be using like uh, stickle bricks, I think they're called, or something. It could be using different types of adult-sized Lego to create a bridge, to be able to put a car over, or to be able to build a structure. These are kind of funny practical exercises which you might get in a a group, uh, which you call it a workplace fun day or something. And it's again, it's easy to think that. This is, it's easy to just get confused and forget that it's a formal day. You know, you're playing with Lego in suits on the floor trying to build a bridge. You're still being assessed. 100% you're still being assessed. You're still being assessed for all of the skills and all the CVFs, the core competencies, and all your policing skills, your interpersonal skills, your teamwork and your communication, your ability to respect others, your, your policing values. Respect, integrity, fairness, human rights. You have to still make sure that you're still displaying them when you're playing with Lego in a suit on the floor. So these ones, again, will last between maybe 20 to 40 minutes. You'll have a set task. You'll have some uh, kit and equipment to be able to use. It could also be that you're, you know, creating something silly like a, a gas pipe and you've got some bits of plastic, and you've got to put them all together. Some of these are very, there's there's too many, well, obviously I wouldn't give you inside information that I personally went through, but there's lots of different styles of exercises. The thing for these one, again, because I've seen it, when I did it, there's people that weren't very hands-on, they just kind of stood in the background. But if you get set into a small team of three, and there's two of you really, really doing everything, and there's one person not doing anything, if you can bring that other person in and say, listen, could you do that? Or what do you think about this? How how, how should we do that? You bring them in, it makes you look like a fantastic team player because you're bringing in people that maybe aren't getting involved. You're coaching and mentoring them. It's an ice cream van going past. And, And you're developing them as well. So there, there you go, there's all the different assessments, the group discussion, the problem solving exercises, decision making exercises, team meeting exercises, practical group exercises and the icebreaker. Things for you to remember, yep, things for you to remember are that you are being assessed by police officers there that have done the job. They know what teamwork looks like, what communication skills looks like what being emotionally intelligent looks like. They're making sure that you deal with conflict well, that you have good dynamics with other people, that you're not obstructive, that you are open to other ideas and other ways of working, and ultimately that you work well with others, and that they're assessing you against the CVF, the competencies, that you're emotionally aware, you take ownership, you work collaboratively, deliver support and inspire, analyse critically, and you're innovative and open-minded. Have a read of them. Make sure that you're reflecting on them as you go through. If you can do that, you're better than me because my head was mashed when I was going through it. But what I just made sure is that I was getting involved in everything. When I, when, when I came to the assessment centre... I'd done this before because I'd been in the military and you do that when you get into the military. But all I focused on 
was making sure that I got involved in everything, that I spoke up when I felt I needed to put my opinion across, or it was, you know, a group discussion I was going to put my opinion across. I made sure that I was always respectful of other people's opinion, even if I disagreed with it. And I would say something along the lines of, well, I, if I'm honest, I disagree with that. And I disagree with that because of this, blah, blah, blah. That's respectful. You're disagreeing, but it's still respectful. So I made sure I was involved in everything. I spoke up. I got, uh, you know, I got my voice heard. I was respectful. I didn't speak over people. A lot of people spoke other people. I didn't see them at Tilly Allen, so they didn't get in. I didn't speak over people. I made sure I was showing the values, respect, integrity, fairness, human rights. It wasn't CBFs at the time, but now it's CBFs. And just make sure you can work as a team, as an individual, and you're respectful, and you can't go too far wrong. Perfect. That was heavy. That was heavy, that, that webinar. The next one is going to be the, uh, the interview, information, and the star model. So have a look at the book because I go into a lot more detail, give specific examples of the assessments, the different styles and what to expect with a couple of examples. I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you enjoyed that webinar. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, welcome to webinar number eight, the penultimate webinar, which if you don't know what penultimate means, it means a second to last. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. So this webinar, we're going to go on about the assessment centre again, but we're going to talk about the interview, information and star. We're not going to go through examples, that'll be in webinar number nine, but we're going to go through the interview basic information and then the STAR method on how to answer the questions. So, what to expect for the Police Scotland interview? Well, first and foremost, it's important to remember that it's a competency-based interview. So what does competency-based mean? It means that for each question, they have a set a competency that they're going to want you to answer. They're going to want you to answer and reflect in that answer. So, for example, the competency might be revolving around one of the CVFs, which we'll come on to in a minute, but it could be about being emotionally aware. And that is the competency that they want you to demonstrate in your answer. doesn't mean that they'll say, tell us when you have been emotionally aware. They might be a bit more specific about that one, and then you've got to reflect that competency in your answer. Make sense? What's important to remember is that it's a competency-based question, but you you will be given a bit of wiggle room, and we'll come on to that in a second. So what does the structure look like for the interview? So there'll be two assessors, two people doing the interview, conducting the interview with you. The interview will be between five to seven questions, all evolving around the CVF, so competencies. The way they normally split it up is that for half of the interview, one person will ask, ask all the questions and the other person will take notes and write it down. <clears throat> and then halfway through, they'll switch over and the other person will ask the questions and the other person will take notes. It's just because they want to make it fair in case one person doesn't write good notes or ask good questions. You know, 50-50 makes it quite fair. The way that they'll ask the question, they'll get you in, they'll take you into the room, they'll settle you down, they'll just ask you a couple of just nicety questions, blah, 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 just to kind of try and put you at ease, even though you'll be tense. There'll be water on the side, or you can take some water in with you. I would suggest you take it in with you as well, just so you've got something. And then they'll explain, so we're going to do a competency-based interview, we're going to cover the CVFs, we're going to ask you... X amount of questions, just say it's six, up to six questions. And what they'll do is they'll ask you the question, right, obviously, and then you'll answer it. But if you don't answer and you don't cover every area that they want you to cover, they will ask you a follow-up question based on that question. So again, let's give a little example. It could be, and I'm taking this off the top of my head, it could be, give us a... Describe a situation where you've had to challenge a colleague's behaviour, okay? 
and through the set criteria that they're wanting you to hit is maybe talking about being emotionally aware, just say it's that, and you're wanting to discuss the communication of being emotional, emotionally aware and then providing that information to, say, a manager or something like that, but you don't cover that in your answer, they'll follow you up and say, so who did you report that incident to? Or how did you communicate that incident to your organisation? So that's kind of prompting you to then say, oh, well, actually, yeah, what, what I did do was I uh, sat down with my manager, explained my concerns, and told them all the information. I followed up with them uh, after that, about two days later, for a follow-up meeting. That That's you showing what they want you to hear. So when I say that, rest assured that they won't just ask you a question. You give an answer, and then that's it. Move on to the next question. They will help you out a bit. And if you've answered it relatively well, but you've just missed one area, they'll follow up specifically. Or even if you just provide not a very good answer, they'll they'll follow up again. But they might they might just sort of narrow the question a little bit, or try and say it again, just in a little bit of a different way. Something to remember, based uh, reflecting on that bit, is that if they ask you a question and your head is just not in it, and you've, you've missed something they've said, there is nothing wrong with saying, sorry, could you just repeat that question again, please? It sounds easy to do. It's actually quite difficult in an interview to, to say that, to take the kind of the time and consideration to be able to say that. But if you, if you don't understand the question being presented to you, you have to just say, sorry, could you please explain that again? And even if you don't, could you explain that just in a little bit of a different way? Sorry, I'm not understanding what you're saying. Most likely the question will be relatively straightforward, but if you didn't hear it, then you can always ask again. Now, this is this is a formal interview, and as such, you do need to be formal. Most likely, once you've done your first question, you will relax into the interview. Naturally, you'll just relax a little bit, and the, the assessors are really good at getting you to relax, they just know what to say and they know how to relax you. But you do need to make sure that you remember that this is a formal interview. Each answer that you give, obviously there's six to seven questions, each, each answer will, will be over five minutes or should be there or thereabouts for five minutes. Now that sounds like a lot of speaking, but really it's not because most likely the examples that you'll be given they're probably pretty cl- uh, complex. There's probably a lot of context behind your answer that you've got to give. We'll talk about the STAR method, the situation, task, action, result. If you follow that, even explaining a very straightforward thing could take a couple of minutes because you're actually setting the scene with the situation. You're talking about the task, you're explaining your actions, and then you're saying what happened, the result. So when you break it down like that, that five minutes will actually go by pretty quickly. Because often uh, an issue people seem to have, or they think they have and when they actually don't, but a lot of people seem to think that this is a long, long interview. I don't have much to say. Well, you actually do. When you break it down to that STAR method, you go into so much more detail than you would have if you didn't use it. We'll come on to that in a second. So... Let's talk about STAR, and STAR is your friend. STAR is a framework that I'd never heard of before until I joined the police or was applying for the police, and I heard about it. I really, really liked it. It really helped me, if I'm honest, again, do a really good interview. I got told I did a really good interview. It really helped me lay out each example, making sure I talk about everything I need to talk about. And actually, since then, when I moved from response police into the CID, again I used the STAR method and smashed the interview at the park. So what does the STAR method actually mean? Well, it's a way that you break your your example, your answer into four sections. And it's situation, task, action, result. Situation, you know, what's going on, the task, what you had to do, the action, what you did do, and what happened, which will be the result. Now, something that people don't tend to explain is how you kind of break that down percentage-wise. Now, a good structure is that 
when you're talking, say it's a 10 minute, say it's five minutes, just say it's five minutes. 20% of that is the situation. Okay, so 20%. The next 20% should be your tasks. You're talking about your task. Action, overall 40%. So just under half your actual actions and then the result at the end. Add that all together, it's 100%. So that's how you tend to break it down. Situation, task, action, result. So let's talk about the situation. The situation is you setting the scene because you've got to remember when the assessors ask you a question, they have no idea what you're about to say. <laughs> so if you just go straight into talking about actions and then result, they've got no idea where you were, you know, when it was, who you're doing it for or on behalf of what or where you were working. So you really need to lay the groundwork and set the situation up so they understand what you're talking about. Make sure that you're using detail, but make sure it's only relevant detail because you've only got 20% to talk about the situation. And when you're talking about the situation, you can also talk about the impact, the impact of what's actually going on, where you're at, what job you're doing what organisation you're working for, maybe the importance of it, maybe the time period, what's going on. And then you talk about the task, and that is essentially what has to be done, what needs to be done. When you're talking about the task, you can explain who decided it needs to be done, maybe a little bit of context behind, behind why it had to be done. You could talk about maybe what was to be considered or how it was considered, you could maybe discuss what was discussed. Make sure that you're talking about it from a first point of view. So a lot of I, not just we or the organization, talk about I, I discussed, I was part of a team because they want to hear, the assessor wants to hear what you did, not what the team did. So we've done situation, we've talked about task. Now we're going to come on to the meat of the answer, which is the action. What happened? This is where you're going to do, as I said, about 40% there or thereabouts. Basically, the majority of your speaking. And you need to go into detail, really provide that detail. Again, talk about it from an I perspective. I did this, I did that, this is what I did. Again, linking back to the values, Police Scotland values, respect, integrity, fairness, human rights. The policing skills, the CVF, specifically that CVF, but all CVS if you can relate it back. Lots and lots of detail, okay? And make sure that when you're providing that answer of the action, that you're still answering the question that was asked of you. Then we come to the final bit, which is result. So that is essentially... What was the outcome, the overall outcome of what happened? You could talk about the result from individual actions or from the overall collective action. You could talk about the result from what you did, what other people did, what the impact of the team was. Making sure you're talking about impact as an overall issue, an overall thing. What was the result? What was the impact of the result? You can also tie in there what you learnt. What was the overall the overall result might be X. It might have been, you know, a mediocre result. It might have been just a normal result. But actually the result was it say increased your knowledge. So the result of what was to be set, say if it was from a, a work point of view. The outcome and result might have been normal, but you actually developed as a person massively. Actually, the team, you know, it might have been a bad result, but the team really developed. That's an even better one. That's really important as well. The results don't always have to be positive. They can be a negative result. But what I would say is if there was a negative result, make sure you draw some positivity, some sort of positive overall impact out of that as well. So, a very quick example, it could be, you know, you're setting... You know, the team was doing a goal, trying to achieve something. It doesn't matter what it was, but the res overall result was you didn't achieve it. You set an outcome, you didn't achieve that outcome. But although you didn't achieve that outcome, collect collectively as a team, you developed massively. Individuals increased their personal skills. 
and thereafter you prove to be able to achieve the outcome, if that makes sense. Again, making sure that you thread the Police Scotland values, respect, integrity, fairness throughout and human rights throughout it. And what I'll come on to is the, the discussion around either having examples of CVFs or examples of just examples. We'll come on to that later on in the webinar. So that's a very, very quick overview of the Police Scotland interview, the STAR methodology, what to expect and how the interview will be structured. Now, we'll come on to examples in the next webinar. Obviously, there are examples, there are examples in the book as well, which I've, I've written for you. But there's nothing better than practicing the interview. Now, one of the packages I provide is obviously the coaching package, which is a, a walk-through, talk-through example interview where we have a little phone call and, and chat through and uh, do an actual practical example of the interview. And there's just no benefit. There's no better benefit than actually practicing an, an interview. Now, do you have to do it with me? Absolutely not. You could sit there, write out six or seven different questions, give them to somebody and say, ask me these. Do it in a formal setting, set a time limit, go. You could sit in your room and just ask it. As long as you practice it. Practicing it really allows you to be able to embody everything that you have to talk about. So when you're given an example, being able to practice it from a point of view of talking about the Police Scotland values and the overall focus and drawing it back to that time and time and again comes with practice. Being able to think of something that you've done and, oh, where was the respect in that? Where was the integrity? Did I show fairness there? Oh, yeah, I did in this way. Being able to just talk about that straight away only comes with practice. So practice makes perfect. It really, really does. Right. I'll see you in the next interview where we will go through some practical examples. <laughs>